Every time they tell me stop, I use Every comment, hate that makes my feel Gather up my energy and boom I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with Giving my blood so I am relentless Here we are, the Keep Hammering Collective with Chris Williamson today. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. This is, uh, I've been waiting for this. I've been following you for a while. I love your content. I love what you put out. And watching you makes me wonder, the Modern Wisdom Podcast is, you made a huge name for yourself. What, how'd that come about? And what is wisdom to you? So I was a club promoter for a very long time. I got to university and wanted to have an excuse to party uh, for free and became pretty good at it. So me and a business partner, the first guy I ever sat next to in my first seminar at university, uh, still 15 years later, we're working together. We hadn't got rid of each other. <laughs> and um, we just wanted to build a business. I love business building, did that for a long time. Got toward the end of my 20s. I'd done some reality TV. I was on some dating shows. Mm -hmm. And then it got to sort of, 27, 28, and I'd done this big reality TV dating show, which was kind of like the pinnacle of uh, the party boy world championships. And I thought, <laughs> is this really all that I've got to offer the world? You know, me mm -hmm. in a tiny pair of swim shorts prancing about on TV. Not that that's not nothing, but it just felt like there was something else missing. Mm -hmm. And even though I loved the work that I'd done, it felt like being a, a crab that kind of was outgrowing his shell mm -hmm. somehow and it was like constraining and I was feeling just ambiently sort of uncomfortable about stuff uh, and that was a good time. It was whatever, 2015, 16. So you had your Jordan Petersons, your Sam Harris's, your Rogan's talking about taking ownership, talking about telling the truth and finding a purpose. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed consuming that stuff. I got invited on some podcasts just because I'd done some TV bits and I really enjoyed the process. And I thought, well, if I do my own, I can do this as much as I want. Mm -hmm. And then it, I just started my show. It's almost five years ago exactly now. Mm. And uh, yeah, we're now 600 episodes in, five years later. That's 600. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. That is so much work. Yeah. I, you know, you're telling that story. Do you think, I know he had a sordid childhood a little bit, talked about bullying and, and being lonely. Do you think that that reality show was kind of a book into that? Like you didn't get much attention as a kid and now you're getting all this attention. Do you think that was part of that journey and, and that's why you, you were drawn to that? That's a really good point. So most of the high performers that I know about are coming from a place of insufficiency. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to prove something to that parent, that teacher, that bully, that group of friends or whatever from their childhood, that they actually are worthy of love or praise or acceptance or admiration. And I think that you could track, certainly through my 20s, the fact that um, I think my fundamental like framing of who I was was people might not like me or want to be around me because of the... Uh, world that I'd come up from being really unpopular and bullied in school. Mm -hmm. But if they need me, that's like close enough. Right. That's a close proxy. I see. So if I'm the guy in the front door of the club with all of the VIP bands. Yeah, the power. People need me. Yeah. Now, obviously, this is fundamentally flawed. Like, you don't need to offer people things mm -hmm. in return for them liking you or wanting you to be in their life. That's not the way that it works. But for me, I, I, I was so convinced that I was flawed and chronically uh, mm -hmm. meant to be alone that I needed to be able to offer the world something in order to be accepted in that way. Right. Um, and yeah, I think that you could see going on the reality TV stuff is just scaling that up. Like, just give me more, give me more, right. more leverage, more scale, more exposure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it, that wouldn't be too wrong to say, but it, 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 it still creeps up in other areas of life. You know, mm -hmm. even with all of the self-work and all of the bits and pieces I've been exposed to over the last six or seven years, I still see it creeping back up. It's very important that I need to keep in check my uh, fears of insufficiency or lack of confidence mm -hmm. or lack of self-belief. How does it crop up? Um, sometimes I feel like success is a fluke mm -hmm. and... Uh, imposter syndrome of nobody knows that I'm not supposed to be here. Right. I think you've mentioned this as well. Mm -hmm. The fact that 
it almost feels like one day someone's going to come out of the woodwork and go, oh, that, this actually isn't your life. Yeah. You actually don't deserve this. Yeah, you're, you're, the, so, you're the lonely kid by yourself. Yeah, that you're nobody not supposed likes. to be here. And, yeah. Oh, shit, we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be you. It's mm -hmm. supposed to actually be that guy over there. And you go, I knew it all along. Right. This is one of the strange things about the routines that you learn when you're a kid because they just seep into all of the sinews of life and they're mm -hmm. so hard to pull out. You know, you can change your approach with relationships at 30 and then 34 and then 38 and you've, you know, you've got perspective. You can at least see them in a different way. Mm -hmm. There's tons and tons of stuff from childhood that I simply can't remember and yet I'm able to call on this like worldview of acceptance or lack mm -hmm. of. And uh, it's very difficult to deprogram in that way. I've spent a lot of time trying to deprogram stuff. So, you know, for anybody that has suffered with bullying as a kid, uh, that felt lonely, that felt isolated, uh, that feels like they need to prove something to the world, like I, I feel for you because that's mm -hmm. me. And the only way, two ways, I suppose, actually, that I've found that have been pretty successful at helping me. One has been having an undeniable stack of proof that I am who I say I am. Mm -hmm. So Rogan calls it building a mountain with layers of paint. Right just one iteration after the next right better mm -hmm. better 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 each single time that you do something you can get yourself to a stage where you've disproven your imposter syndrome so many times in the real world that it just has to it's crushed mm -hmm. under this ridiculous weight of evidence yeah right you yeah go, there's no way that you could continue to exist <laughs> and the other side is to yeah. find find people that just want you for you Mm -hmm. You know, this is friends, this is family, this is partners. Right. Uh, and if you've got someone who there's no contingency for mm -hmm. why they want to be around you. Yeah. Uh, That's hard though, because they know you as you now and you now is like, you know, looks like a, a model fit, popular, has power because you have a, a platform. So, yeah, I mean, I understand that, you know, you can't, you have changed, but I think you're, still the worry is like, I'm still that kid. Do they only want me because of now my position? Right. And this is one of the problems of success. I think this is why you have, you know, actors that you find out about uh, their entire entourage was pushing them. Avicii, this mm -hmm. famous DJ who didn't want to continue playing mm -hmm. and all of the friends that were around him, right. his assistants and his managers and stuff, they it looked like they were pushing him to continue to play because... Mm -hmm. They were invested in that. Not yeah. only were they monetarily invested, but that was their status. That was their lifestyle. That was mm -hmm. what they wanted to do. And they were prepared to p push this guy to the stage where he had to take his own life. So you can uh, definitely when you start to gain accolade or success, mm -hmm. the motivation of the people that are around you can be called into question. Yeah. And yeah. if you've got that framing already that maybe the world doesn't want me for me, mm -hmm. you can, what was this, this quote that I heard? Um, a negative mind will find any way to make the world fit his priors. Right. So if you go into a situation mm -hmm. adamant that this is, that you are unlovable, unwanted, broken, flawed, insufficient, mm -hmm. you will manage to warp reality to be able to fit what you already believe. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, I found myself, one thing that I, I enjoy about your podcast and your style is, I, of course, the Goggins podcast came out recently, last Monday, and I was probably, I, I don't know, maybe one of the first ones to listen to it. I was so pumped. I was like, I got to go on a run so I can listen to this. Because when I'm running, there's no distractions and I can just absorb every word. But I found myself distracted too, because as Goggins was talking about his experience and you were, you know, probing and, and it had me, had me reflecting back on my journey too, which I think is the beauty of podcasts and there's a beauty of discussion and storytelling, which is what makes this platform so powerful. But, um, it had me thinking of, uh, childhood pain basically. And, you know, I'm 55 years old. It's just like, come, get over it. Right. But I still think that, man, that you still, it, I don't know if it ever goes away, but it had me wondering too, do you remember as a child, um, the most painful thing you had to go through as a young man? And I'm trying to, I'm trying to validate myself wondering it, maybe it's just me or do people remember? So for me, there's no individual situation that occurred. Mm -hmm. It was like, a. um, 
what's that Japanese water torture type thing? Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a consistent drip, ambient drip forehead thing sense yeah. of, yeah. And I think, I don't know, I would be interested to look at the psychology behind what happens if someone has an indiv a single, very traumatic event mm -hmm. versus a more protracted mm -hmm. drawn out, um, suffering. Uh, and you know, like, dude, I wasn't abused. My parents were great. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we didn't come from a rich place, but uh, in, there wasn't anything that I was struggling for. Like right. I weren't poor, I wasn't starving, mm -hmm. but I was alone. Mm -hmm. I was an only child and I didn't have very many friends and I was bullied in school mm -hmm. and you can create an awful lot of suffering yourself mm -hmm. off the back of that. And I also think, you know, talking about I'm 55, like time to get over it, like fuck that. The, the priors that you have become the laws of physics mm -hmm. that your world exists within. And if you have a particular type of worldview that you've held for a very long time, that doesn't make it easier to get rid of. That makes it harder to get mm -hmm. rid of. You know, the fact that you can carry a burden with you for 55 years doesn't mean like, oh, well, now it's time to drop it. You right. go, oh, fuck, it's, it's fused into my fucking flesh, right? right? It's part of me mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I understand. I, what, what came to my mind was, and it wasn't, you know, I had whatever sort of childhood is fine. But what the hardest thing for me was, I remember I left living with my mom because I didn't like my stepdad. Uh, moved in with my dad in town here, you know, from the small town out where we drove yesterday. And then I was, I felt lonely, which is why your story kind of resonates with me because we moved to Portland. I was on my own. My brother wasn't there. So the very, the thing that I remember being the hardest as my childhood was telling my dad that I wanted to move back with my mom because it was like this divorce thing. It was kind of a, a pulling back and forth, you know, my mom, of course, wanted me there. My dad wanted to win this little battle, have have me with him. And I wanted to be with him because he was my real dad. But then I was just so lonely. And so to telling him I want to move back with my mom was, you know, kids say crazy things to their parents. They say, yeah, I don't love you. And, you know, it's just kids being stupid and trying to, to hurt people. But that I knew that hurt him deeply and and man, as a, so as an eighth grade, so probably, well, I don't know, 13 or 14 telling my dad, you know, I want, I want to move away, man, that was rough. Cause it hurt him. Well, the reason that it hurts you is because you care about people. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this yesterday, you mm -hmm. know, fundamentally one of the reasons that we get hurt when we watch other people suffering is that we see the good in people. We don't want to see other people suffer. Mm -hmm. And for you to be on your own and want to be back with your brother mm -hmm. because your brother would be social support. He would be like literal physical support if you're in school and, mm -hmm. you know, you would have your boy back. Yeah. But one of the side effects or byproducts of you no longer being alone was your dad now being alone. Yeah. And you have to say, I mean, this is the person that stays in a relationship because they think that the other partner is not going to be able to deal with it by right. themselves. This is the uh, daughter or son that never leaves the hometown because the grandma and grandpa are going to be, they're not going to have anyone to look after them. You mm -hmm. know, like these sorts of trade-offs that people have are, they're serious. Mm -hmm. Like they're not the things that should be snarked at. They're not just simple situations. Right. They're, they're incredibly difficult because there are, it's like apples and oranges. Like how, how many lonely nights without your brother is worth your dad not feeling insufficient. Like right. what, how the fuck am yeah. I supposed to weigh these two can't things? Can't win up? that one. Yeah. Can't, can't make it work. Yeah. yeah. The math doesn't work. Yeah. And even in retrospect, you know, mm -hmm. you can spend 40 years going back over this conversation mm -hmm. with yourself yeah. and still not working out. Was that the right decision? Yeah. Yeah. Did I do the right thing? Yeah. It's uh that's why I say it's, it's hard looking back cause it's, on one hand, I'm like, you know, whatever. Why am I still thinking about this? But uh, it's because you're a good man. That's why. <sighs> it's because you care about other people and you don't want other people to hurt. You know, I don't. So here's the thing, too. I actually don't think I'm good because I know my, I know how my brain works. It's like it reminds me of another thing. Somebody was the other day was talking shit about Goggins, and I was, you know. I have a hard time with that because, um, I feel like 
and maybe this is why I'm questioning myself because I feel like some people, I mean, I've met people, regular people who think they are amazing at whatever they do. They're the best, you know, and I look at what they're doing and what they're producing and I'm like, you're not the best, dude. And I saw this guy talking shit about Goggins and I'm like, what are you, this guy influences millions of people. Do you really think you're looking down on him and you can, you have, what have you done where you have that, where you should be judging somebody like Goggins, right? Who has, um, two New York times, bestsellers, multiple world records, a, a Navy SEAL served his country for 17 years. And what have you done? But this guy is, I think some people get, um, they over, I guess, I guess over, uh, estimate what they're doing, what they're contributing, or are they delusional? So I'm like, you say I'm a good guy. I'm like, I look at myself in the mirror and I know the thoughts I have about, you know, I'm like, this guy, screw this guy. I know, you know, who I really am. So it's, it's hard. And I wonder, can people buy their own BS or are they delusional? What, what do you, th how do you perceive that? You can manage to convince yourself of pretty much anything. Okay, right? yeah. This is the same as the priors thing, mm -hmm. right? Like if you have come into a situation um, believing that your self-worth is almost always determined by your monetary wealth, mm -hmm. let's say. So your parents perhaps were keeping up with the Joneses when right. you were younger or perhaps they showed love through uh, presents. Christmas was a huge deal and birthdays were a big deal and it was always about new shoes and new cars and blah, blah, and holidays mm -hmm. and stuff. You are going to go into the world with a presumption that that is where your self-worth is derived from. Mm. <clears throat> That's no more or less real than anybody else's priors. Right. It's less effective. Mm -hmm. And this particular person, if their fundamental source of value is comparison mm -hmm. between them and somebody else, absolutely. To them, that is a, that's the physics of their life. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not the sort of person that I want to be around. Yeah, They're not the sort of person that I spend my time with. Mm -hmm. But I'd, I would be hesitant as you seeing the mean or nasty thoughts or the retributive fantasies that mm -hmm. you have about calling this person out or meeting them in an alley or doing whatever, you <laughs> yeah. know, like yeah. we don't have control over our thoughts in that sort of a way. It mm -hmm. doesn't make you a bad person to have bad thoughts. Like this is what was so interesting about, um, do you remember Minority Report? Yes. With Tom Cruise? Yeah. So I always think about that film because it showed what would happen if people's intentions were able to be used to project forward their actions. Now, mm -hmm. it was actually more complex than that. It was actually able to work out what was going on. But you could imagine a world in which cancellation came not from the things you said, but from the things you thought. Right, yeah. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> but that would be that would be terrifying, yeah. dude. Some of the things, like, and this is the concern that people have about parents calling, or children calling their parents out for the stuff that's said in the home. Mm -hmm. My dad said this sexist or racist joke right. in the house. Because what is happening is you are, ever more constraining the space within which people can openly think Trust. or play with ideas. Right. Uh, and there is a question like, are there some ideas that are so toxic and, and, and brutal that they shouldn't ever even be said out loud, even in the comfort of your own home? Mm -hmm. For the most part, people would say, no, like the, there has to be a boundary. Right. But you could push that one step further and say, are there some thoughts that are so toxic that you shouldn't even be allowed to have them inside the comfort of your own head? Yeah. And I would be very hesitant around you know, taking a sense of self-worth or accusing yourself of being, I don't know, any kind of person for not, for thinking things that are just a natural response to someone that's being a dick. Yeah. Like this guy is being, <laughs> he's being a penis and, and, yeah. and rightly so, but it, it's about your actions, right? Mm -hmm. And let's flip it on its head. So imagine that someone said to you, uh, Cam, I really love what you do with regards to your training. I just wanted to let you know, like, I'm one of the most motivated people on the planet. And you go, wow, like, how does that manifest? And you go, well, mm -hmm. dude, I think about training all the time. <laughs> right. You would say, well, you're not training. Mm -hmm. how, how much do you go out and do? Oh, well, no, I, I don't actually go out and do any training at all. But I think about it a lot. Right. If I flip that round mm -hmm. to you and I say, you think bad thoughts and do good things. Mm hmm that doesn't make you a bad person. Right, I see, the actions. The Correct. actions speak louder than the thoughts, for sure. Correct. Yes. And there was another thing from uh, that I learned from Jocko. He had this conversation with Sam Harris like five years ago. Mm. I was listening to it in preparation for the conversation I had with him uh, a few months ago. The, the episodes that we're talking about, we'll put them in the show notes below, the Goggins and the, yeah. the Jocko and stuff, if people right. want to go and check those out. Right, they, of course. They were both great. And um, 
Sam was saying that courage or bravery is an emotion that you can't fake. Mm -hmm. He said that doing the courageous or brave thing in spite of not wanting to do it is bravery. Right. There's no such thing as fake bravery. Right. If you do the thing and mm -hmm. didn't want to do it, that's bravery. And if you don't do the thing despite wanting to do it, that's cowardice. Right. But motivation works the same way. Mm. If you do the thing and mm -hmm. you didn't want to, that is motivation. It doesn't right. matter whether you felt motivated or not. Right. The I outcome see. is what matters. Yeah. Right. The efforts are. And the same thing is uh, right in reverse when it comes to being a good person. Mm -hmm. Like if you do good things with bad thoughts, <laughs> that's being even more good in my eyes. Well, if, good. If Thank you, you. I overcame more because <laughs> I wasn't starting at zero. I was starting at less than zero. Started at such a dick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, good. I feel better. Well, that's a good segue to this wisdom thing. Where have you, were you a boy genius? Did you, were you a vor, voracious reader? What, how did, where did this perspective and wisdom come from? I mean, your podcast is Modern Wisdom. And I have to say, when I listen to you, I do, I feel smarter. I'm, I'm not smarter. I feel smarter. So where did the, where's the wisdom piece come from? Oh man, I'm just repurposing what other people have said. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I, well, I no, mean, you have that perspective, the perspective you just had on the thoughts that, mm. that seems. But that's taken from Sam, right? Like that's Sam's idea that I've repurposed and I've run with it for a couple more. I've just developed that across, mm -hmm. well, it could be courage, but then it could be motivation, but then it could be being a good person. Mm -hmm. So it's a perfect example. Like I, I can't remember who it was that said, uh, there are no new thoughts under the sun. Mm -hmm. And the point there is that a lot of the big problems and big questions that human, humans ask themselves have been asked already right. and they percolate through whether that be directly through a quote in a book or indirectly through culture or the way that your parents looked at each other or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like you can take these things. They already yeah. exist out there. Um, so I don't know. I, I spent almost all of my twenties dude being a professional party boy, mm -hmm. like the most fun, outgoing, degenerate lifestyle that you can think of. 30 trips back and forth to Ibiza, a thousand club nights stood on the front door, met a million people going in and out of mm -hmm. nightclubs. Like, this wasn't the environment in which that you were supposed to cultivate, I don't know, like a wisdom approach to life. <laughs> right. like I wasn't asking people about answers to the Fermi paradox around why there's no aliens out there mm -hmm. on the front door. It was like, hi, mate, bye, mate, here's your VIP band, mate. Yeah. That was my life. Right. So I don't know. I think the opportunity to learn has always excited me. Mm. And um, the introspection or the curiosity, it's really curiosity, I think. Mm hmm this sort of short answer is just, I'm so fucking interested about mm -hmm. everything. Right. And other people are as well. And it's just a quirk of whatever version of the simulation that we live in, that I can call that a job, that I can commercialize that, weaponize mm -hmm. that, utilize that. Right. And I can then deploy it. And then other people get to learn from the shit that I learned. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about this last night, The uh, because you have a, a truck, which is very, very nice, but very, very analog. Mm -hmm. Like there's no self-driving, there's no nothing else. It's like you put your foot on the floor, it makes yeah. a big loud noise and it goes fast in the straight line. <laughs> That's right. Um, but I was thinking about Tesla's uh, dri automatic driving, self-driving car mm -hmm. system. And I learned about this thing from a data scientist that the reason that Tesla is so much further ahead than all of the other competitors is because it's accumulating more and more road miles to train its own system on. Mm. So because they've got this uh, broad distribution. More data. Precisely. And mm -hmm. that means that more data makes the system better, mm -hmm. which then iterates an even better experience, which makes them sell more cars, which means that they get more data, which means that da, 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 right. all the way up. Yep. Um, and that means that they leave any competition mm -hmm. in the dust very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I realized that there is a, it's called a power law, right? Uh, so the, the Matthew principle says, it's a quote from the Bible, um, to those who have everything, more will be given. Mm -hmm. To those who have nothing, more will be taken. Right. Uh, and it, it explains why uh, success begets more success and mm -hmm. failure begets more failure. Yeah. People uh, hate to hear that, don't they? Yeah, because <clears throat> it identifies that it isn't some ruthless capitalist malign force that's keeping them from success and mm -hmm. giving it to other people. Mm -hmm. It's a natural byproduct of the way that increasing success begets more success. Uh, Is that, was a Bible referencing faith? Was a Bible talking about more faith begets more faith? I think that it was m more to do with 
at least my interpretation of it is it's more to do with poverty and success mm. in in kind of uh, the social realm however yeah. i would imagine it, it, it's the same with everything dude confidence right. mm -hmm. you know the people who are on an absolute tear whether this be in the nba or in podcasting or in art or in music or in whatever mm -hmm. that are just they everything they touch is magic mm -hmm. And it just gets better and better and yeah. better. And then you see the people that are on the other side of that hill mm -hmm. and they everything that they do just gets worse. And that reinforces their fears about it being worse. The um, baseball pitcher that's got the yips, yeah. right? Just can't hit anything yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, and what I realized was that the show and my exposure to all of these people, you know, Jordan Peterson, Jocko Willink, Andrew Huberman, and David Goggins, like all of these different people, mm -hmm has given me the same kind of um, competitive advantage that Tesla has. Mm -hmm. Because for each podcast that I do, that's another layer of paint, right. as Rogan would call it. Yeah, more data for you to Precisely. know what works, what p resonates. More interlinking stories. Yes. Uh, and that means that when you have a conversation with someone, dude, I've had a conversation with a guy who's trying to re-engineer human DNA to be able to survive space flight mm. because our, our DNA is very, very fragile and space doesn't have the protection of mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, from radiation that we have here on earth. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems that we're going to have, even if you could create the life support systems, you could create a propulsion uh, system that would get us to Alpha Centauri or whatever sufficiently quickly, DNA is going to suffer. It's mm -hmm. going to be really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm like, okay, well, fuck, who have I spoken to that's got something similar to do with this? And there is something. Mm. And that's where... Um, you can start to see people that look unbelievably competent, the Goggins of the world. Mm -hmm someone that has this inhuman level of capacity mm -hmm. and yet layers of paint every single day for years and years and yeah. years and decades. Mm -hmm. You can see how that happens. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess your, your wisdom journey, I'm still thinking about that too, because I was, I was, you're at the nightclub and I'm thinking it's definitely a different path path than Marcus Aurelius, you know, to gain that wisdom. But and the, what, why I was thinking about that is you said you're kind of repurposing as been discussed before, just as Ryan Holiday has proven, Marcus's wisdom is still relevant today. I mean, you read, uh, what is, what is his meditations. writings? Meditations. And it's, it's like, it can apply today. How, how does that work? But I guess it goes back to your point that nothing's really changed. Correct. Is the, that right? The fundamental problems that everybody faces are the same as they've always been. Mm -hmm. The original name for meditations was Letters to Himself. Right. That was what he, he wrote it as. It was never meant to be published. Uh, so you can imagine this, you know, philosopher God King who is trying to be virtuous in a time of massive corruption. He deals yeah. with the Antonine Plague. You know, this this basically a pandemic which affects half of the Roman Empire or something. And mm -hmm. he gets... Uh, struck down and his only surviving son or his eldest surviving son is this like party boy idiot mm -hmm. uh who really shouldn't ascend the throne but he because aurelius was given such a leg up by his mentor he kind of has faith that you can craft a very rough rock into mm -hmm. a beautiful gemstone and, mm -hmm. and unfortunately that doesn't seem to be the case when his son does come into power but yeah i Nothing is that particularly new. But mm -hmm. another thing <clears throat> that I really love, one of my favorite things from Marcus Aurelius is the whole universe is change and life itself is but what we deem it. Mm -hmm. Life itself is but what we deem it. The eight most profound words in all of philosophy. Mm -hmm. What he means is that things are going to happen. You are going to have experiences in life. Almost all of the important impacts of how those experiences change you are going to be the story that you tell yourself about what that experience means. Hmm. How you interpret it. So you could imagine that you are yesterday, me and you had to carry a 72 pound rock up mm -hmm. a 1.5 mile hill. That's mm -hmm. got a thousand feet of ascension. Right. The way that I felt after doing that first leg up a very steep incline mm -hmm. was painful, but satisfying. Mm -hmm. I knew why I felt that way, mm -hmm. right? The story that I told myself about why my heart rate was at 140, 150, and my shoulders were burning, and I was sweating, and all of this stuff, was because of what I'd done. Mm -hmm. If I felt that spontaneously sat in a car in traffic, mm -hmm. I would call an ambulance. Right. I think, what the fuck is happening to me? I'm definitely right. having a panic attack or, or, or a, a, a heart attack or something. Mm -hmm. So the story that you tell yourself in 
some regard very much is what's happening. Right. You know, the framing that you place around the present moment mm -hmm. largely determines your experience of it. And this is where having faith in yourself, having mm -hmm. confidence in yourself, you know, an undeniable stack of proof that you yeah. can deal with whatever is put in front of you is super important. Yeah, it's true. Well, it's, you know, I, I learned people, they watch things like this and you don't, you don't really know the person. Yeah. You can listen to hours. You can try to interpret what they're saying, infer what they actually mean, who they are, but you don't really know. But how I find out what type of person somebody is, is you put a fucking rock on their back. Right. And so what I, what I saw yesterday, um, people who don't know, you can make all sorts of assumptions, but what I saw yesterday was, and why I like doing it is because when someone suffers, there's never a more honest time. You can't fake when you're suffering, you can't fake it. It's one reason why suffering, the mob has used torture to, they're going to pull out fingernails. They're going to find out the truth about a person. The military puts their, they make their men suffer because they want to find out who's weak and who's the best because you cannot lie when you're suffering. What I saw yesterday is you were suffering. It hurt, but I liked, I saw a clip, um, the guys filmed of you. I was watching it last night. You're going up the hill and you were talking about suffering for no reason, I think is how you termed it is, uh, is a challenge. You know, it's not like you're doing a race. It's not like anybody's watching, so to speak. But <clears throat> d do you think that suffering is the ultimate truth teller, truth serum? It definitely opens people up. Mm -hmm. So this was two things again from Goggins, which like people need to go and check this episode out because it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Um, two concepts from his new book. One is performance without purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other is chosen and unchosen suffering. Mm -hmm. So unchosen suffering is going to happen in life. Mm -hmm. Your parents are going to pass away. Loved ones are going to die. Your relationships are going to break down. Your body is going to fail you. You're going to become ill or sick or destitute. Things are going to happen mm -hmm. that you have no control over. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can prepare yourself for unchosen suffering is with chosen suffering. Right. You can elect to put yourself into a position to become a stronger alloy of whatever the metal is that you're mm -hmm. made of. And by purposefully choosing difficult things, you will armor yourself against that situation. Mm -hmm. It's still going to suck. Mm -hmm. But think about how much more fragile you would be if you hadn't overcome all of this stuff. We spoke about this yesterday. Every single person that I know that is incredibly successful in a balanced way mm -hmm. and has a good perspective on it elects to do very hard things regularly. Mm -hmm. It humbles them. It reminds them that they're just mortal. Mm -hmm. And it also means that if the entire mainstream media apparatus tries to come down on top of you, let's mm -hmm. say, just as a hypothetical, yeah. uh, let's say that that occurs, that you can deal with it because you know that you've dealt with a thousand disgusting kettlebell workouts followed by a cold tub or right. whatever. Right. And then the performance without a purpose thing is, is from David's new book as well. And I found that very interesting because a lot of the time people need an excuse to perform. Mm-hmm. They need a race to be working toward, a goal, a holiday, a photo shoot, a wedding. Right. And that is what drives them forward. And, you know, that's not nothing. That's an incredibly powerful, potent motivator. Yeah. But it's worked for a, long, a lot of people. If you can manage to perform without that, mm -hmm. that's real power. Mm. Because it means that not only are you going to choose your suffering, but you're going to continue to hit close to your maximum performance. Mm -hmm with no finish line, mm -hmm. no crowd celebrating your completion, right. no glory, no nothing. Mm. Uh, and that's why, you know, you carrying this fucking pointless rock <laughs> up a hill with yeah. marker pen on it yeah, is with no one there. Mm -hmm. That's why that's impressive. That's mm. why that, and that's something that for me, I, as I've got more mature into my training age, mm -hmm. I, I find it like, I like training with my boys more. Mm -hmm. I was prepared to push myself harder on my own mm -hmm. in the past. And now I like to train, uh, train with my boys mm -hmm. and like throw down and get some metal music on all the rest right. of it. And that's fun, mm -hmm. but it has made me more fragile when it comes to training on my own. I mm -hmm. can't push myself as hard. So that's mm -hmm. something having seen you, having spent time with Goggins, that's something that I'm going to try and uh, reintroduce like that, yeah. that ability to be self-powered as well as uh, use the motivation of others. Yeah. And, and Goggins is, it seems like he's mastered that because he doesn't post often. So it's, uh, he's doing it every day. You know, his routine, you guys talked about that in detail and people I think that follow him know his routine, but he's a master of <clears throat> suffering on his own. 
<clears throat> and I think that's that's what's given him great power and influence. And it's you're right, it's not easy. But yeah, I was thinking too about Marcus's uh, writings to himself or meditations to himself or whatever that was. And it's like, so my version of that is I wrote poser on that rock. <laughs> so that's the only one word. And, uh, and I just like thinking about, yeah, people call me a poser and I'm like, that's all I need. That, so that's my version of Marcus's deep thoughts. So Goggins <laughs> has got a very similar um, motivation desire that you do, I think. I asked him... <clears throat> Toward the end of the episode, I start saying uh, someone is struggling to do hard things. And he was like, what are the excuses for it? And I said, well, it's cold outside. The couch is warm. He His said, partner's keep going, an argument. Keep going. And he's saying, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he says, I need you to keep going. Yeah. And I was like, this is like a sex thing, David. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, uh, you, you're hungover. You've had a hard day at work. And he's like, yep, yep, yep. And he's like, that shit there makes me mm -hmm. happy. Yeah. Because I know that everybody else is facing that and that everybody else is going to fold with that. Right. And um, I, I reflected on that segment a good bit. And, and I've also reflected on your like poser thing as well. And not bitterness or resentment, but uh, the desire to prove other people wrong mm -hmm. is a fucking potent fuel. Yeah. But it is toxic. Mm -hmm. I do think that as much as proving other people wrong is great and useful and can get you a good amount of the way there, I do wonder how much peace you find with that. And right. I asked Goggins that as well. I yeah. said, have you found peace? Mm -hmm. And he says, when you go to war with yourself, mm -hmm. you find an awful lot of peace. Right. So maybe the only way out is through with stuff like this. But mm -hmm. I think we've spoken about, we spoke about a good amount in the car yesterday that I want for the people that do this sort of thing that are going to war with themselves, mm -hmm. I do want them to go to bed on a nighttime having made a sacrifice, having tried to inspire other people, but I want them to be at peace. You know, I don't care about whether they're happy or not, but I do want them to be peaceful. Right. And um, it does make me think like if I could gift just a little bit more um, insight around like how much you impact people, the Davids of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just to like, ah, oh, fuck, like if the guys could have a tiny bit more mm -hmm. peace, but if you had a little bit more peace, how much less motivation and discipline would you have? That's what I was thinking of right then, because I also hear what I hear when people say peace like that is I also see a lot of people say the key is balance. <clears throat> and when I think about that, I'm like, if you're balanced, you're probably not doing shit to stand out. You're going to be very, a lot of people are balanced. You know, they, they go run a mile, they have a cookie. Yeah. Very balanced. Re, you know, re, you rewarded your effort. The best, the people I know who are the best at what they do are not balanced. And I don't know about how peace relates to that. Um, I don't, I feel at peace in the mountains at home. I never feel, I feel like I, I don't, I have a hard time sleeping because I'm like, I should be uh, putting miles, doing work. I'm wasting time sleeping. Would you rather life be a way where you were able to sleep for longer? Where you were able to take time off the mountain? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, this is all I really know. I, mm -hmm. I know, you know, sacrificing more makes me, you know, it feels like when you're exhausted, like last night, <clears throat> I'm like, we had a good day, good training day, uh, good brotherhood. Love, love the fellowship. I felt pretty good last night. I was distracted with thinking about this discussion today, you know, because I, I was kind of intimidated because this is kind of an aside, but all the preparation you do to prepare, you know, to be at your best podcast wise. And I'm like, oh my God, I fucking suck. I, I don't do anything. It's like everything he does, I do the opposite. And so I was a little intimidated, but I was at peace with the effort yesterday. So that's, mm. but that's not balanced. I mean, because... It's not, and this is where I think it, it, it's it, it's very interesting looking at the sort of inspiration that guys like you and David give to normal people, right? Um, you are in the top 0.1 percentile of people that do hard things, unshows and suffering on a daily basis. And that inspires a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. um, but you hear this a lot, like, uh, I'm glad for the inspiration, but I wouldn't want to live that life. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could almost see it as kind of like how a scout for a, an army is going out that on their own, you know, they're suffering with wilderness and loneliness and foraging for food and all the rest of it. 
for but what the good they, of the troops. What they bring back is mm-hmm. the information that makes the rest of the army better. Hmm. And that's a fucking noble purpose. Hmm. That's an incredibly noble purpose. I haven't thought about that before. Yeah. I mean, I do see, because I think, did you ask Goggins or maybe he's talked about being at, I don't know, um, the suffering. It's like, how can you be at peace suffering? But yeah, I mean. When you go to war with yourself, you find a lot of peace. Yeah. But here's another thing as well. We we spoke about this before we started that um, you can't take part of someone's life right? Mm-hmm. Someone can't look at you or Goggins and say, I, do you know what it is? I really like his approach to training, but <clears throat> I don't want to sleep four hours a night mm-hmm. or uh, permanently feel like I should be out there getting in miles. Right. I want Cam's motivation for training, but I don't want to have to deal with like the uh, permanent ambient discontent right. around not working harder. Mm-hmm. You're do- th- you don't get this right. is an outfit. This mm-hmm. is a onesie, mm-hmm. right? You have to take every single bit. You have to take the bad childhood. You have to take the loneliness at the age of 13. You have to take mm-hmm. the regret for four decades about the decision to leave your father. Every single bit of you mm-hmm. has contributed to make the person that you are. Right. And this is where um, it's like alchemy, like mm-hmm. taking something which is toxic or bad or useless and turning it into something which is positive. Mm-hmm. Uh that is where the magic lies, I right. think. Mm. And it's the same for me as well, you know, going from how could I take <clears throat> a childhood where I was uh, alone and uh, flawed, felt like I was flawed, felt mm-hmm. like there was something wrong with me and that I needed to find a way to fix that. I needed Mm -hmm. to find out why. I would obsess over stuff like why uh, people in school tied their ties a certain way or Mm -hmm. the type of shoes that they had or the type of haircut they had. Mm -hmm. And I'd be adamant that that was the reason that they had a good group of friends Mm -hmm. and and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And it it was because of the fact that they were able to socially connect and I didn't. I didn't Mm -hmm. have the same social skills that they did. Right. Uh, But you roll the clock forward 20 years Mm -hmm. and that level of attention and introspection has meant that I can have insights that I really value right. and then I can talk about them and maybe they help some other people too. So on the bright side of a lot of the things that you're ashamed about yourself for mm-hmm. are some of the things that you're most proud of yourself for as well. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's a double-edged sword yeah. and, and on one side is the suffering that you've been through a lot of it unchosen mm-hmm. and on the other side are the things that people praise you for the most. Right. Yeah. It's a rocky journey, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, one thing, my whole point with this podcast is talking to outliers and that's, I look, I see you as an outlier of, you know, wisdom of leadership of uh, perspective. What's your, so you've made this impact and I see, I see your trajectory and I see it. I think it's going to skyrocket because you're like, you remind me of Jordan Peterson, but also like a David Beckham type, like, you know, bro, E. Peterson. (laughs) I don't know, but. Uh, what's your goal? Which, I mean, uh, what's yeah. your goal? Where are you taking this? Um, I'm really not very good at having long-term plans. Mm-hmm. And I came from the productivity space. When I first started the podcast, it was big into the world of productivity. And that was something that I always felt a little bit like a fraud for because mm-hmm. in productivity, you're supposed to have your uh, 10 year goal with your one year stretch with your 90 day sprint with your daily actions. And mm-hmm. this is how you build it up. And, I was good at doing the daily stuff, but I just never had a long-term plan. And mm-hmm. it's the same with this. Like, I just don't know where it's going to go. Mm-hmm. I, I, I still feel like the podcast is hopelessly undersubscribed compared with where it could be. Yeah. So that excites me, the fact that we've got more headroom for growth. But I would like to um, start to really try and pay it forward to people because for a long time, you're slipstreaming everybody else's clout and you're kind of repurposing ideas from other people. And it gets to a stage after a while that you can be a springboard for ideas that you think are super important. Mm -hmm. Uh, And reminding guys, but girls as well, like that there is so much agency that they can have. Mm -hmm. They can change themselves so much. Mm -hmm. If that was the impact that I had where it just gives people a greater sense of control over their own lives, Mm Dude, I consider that a win. I mean, it looks like I'm going to start maybe trying to write a book or two Mm -hmm. uh, over the next couple of years. Um, Some live shows. I'm getting a lot of offers to do sort of live talks, and that really excites me as well. Um, Maybe some products of some kind. I think there's 
some gaps, having spent a lot of time working with partners yeah. and, and, and mm -hmm. stuff for the show, there's certain things, products out there that I wish were out there and I want to make them, mm. uh, which is cool. But it's not really about, it, it's all just a byproduct for me of learning. It's like, mm -hmm. if I can satisfy my curiosity every single day, right. everything else is going to be fine. I see. Um, so, yeah, I was just, I was just thinking about uh, on your journey, it seems like, I see you reaching a lot of men. What's the breakdown on men to women? Uh, on audio, it's about 65, 35. Mm. Uh, on YouTube, it's like 90, 10 or, or mm -hmm. um, 85, 15. Mm -hmm. YouTube skews massively male in any case. Right. Why is that? Well, you know, my daughter watches a lot of book review shows. Those are all girls. Mm. But why do you, why do you think... Uh, that YouTube is skewed for men. I don't know. I think it's skewed for men for the type of content that we're putting out. Okay. Uh, I mean, you call her daddy or whatever mm -hmm. girls watch or listen to. It's not like girls don't use YouTube, but right. for when it comes to the personal development stuff, I don't know. I don't know. The, the algorithm is a hell of a beast. And it just <laughs> it just starts to deliver yeah. stuff. But you know, I mean, if you're a guy that's watching endurance racing or slap fighting or whatever, mm -hmm. the likelihood that you also get served David Goggins on a podcast <laughs> is probably pretty high. Pretty high, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that brings me to another point. All the people that I follow, and maybe it is the algorithm controlling my entire life, but these people who are influential right now, um, and we'll just say uh, Goggins, Jocko, Rogan, is there a common theme? You can throw you in there too as this ascension up. Um, everybody is fit and disciplined. Is that is there people who are not fit and not disciplined who are influential? Well, think about it this way. Do you think that the most successful people in the world became successful and then got disciplined? Or do you think that they became disciplined and then right. got successful? Yeah, obviously the latter, yeah. Correct. Yeah. You know, it's an outcome. Now, you that's not for me to say that there aren't undisciplined people that have managed to get super, super successful. Like, we all know that there's flukes out there. Yeah. And I come from that world, right? Like, I came from this reality TV, obligation-free status, mm -hmm. plucked out of obscurity, and six weeks later, two million followers and a million pound fast fashion deal that's the world that I came from, mm -hmm. right? And that is the most transactional, low investment way that somebody can become super famous and mm -hmm. successful yeah. from nothing. Right. <clears throat> However, I don't think that's scalable. And the only way that that happens is you beat the odds. Mm -hmm. It's like a lottery. You ever see the right. Hunger Games? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like it's being plucked out of obscurity and mm -hmm. hoping that you're going to be given this opportunity. Right. Yeah. That's not, that's not how most people are going to win. Most people are going to Discipline. win by through discipline. Okay. Yeah. Correct. It, and so I, and again, is it the algorithm or is it just the people I'm seeing? But, uh, we spoke about this a little yesterday. Those seem like mo Joe, Joe would say he's a centrist, but more right leaning, hard work type mindset. I don't know about political. Um, some of those guys don't talk politics, but who is influential on the left for the, let's say, we talked about, we reach mostly men. I mean, you, you said 90, 10 on YouTube, 65, 35, but that's still mostly men. I'm 90, 10. Um, who is having influence on the left for these young, the, the men that we're talking about and, and people characterize young men as many times the power of the company because, or power of the country, excuse me, because they're the ones building the roads, putting in the infrastructure, building the infrastructure, water and power, um, going to war, that's young men. That feels like the power of a country. So who on the left is reaching those type of people? I would say a guy called Hassan Abi, who mm -hmm. is a Twitch streamer. He is the, uh, I think, uh, nephew of one of the founders of the Young Turks, Cenk Uga. Uh, there's another guy called Destiny, uh, also another Twitch streamer, mm -hmm. like very much from the left, but Destiny especially is a very, very well-meaning guy. He mm. is uh, super open to having conversations. I'm doing a panel with him in Austin in a couple mm. of months' time. Uh, he regularly goes on shows where he disagrees with people. He, this guy, is he plays StarCraft, which is like a, a strategy role-playing game, right? Tri Twitch streaming is games, right? It, it is usually, although there is increasingly people like Hassan who just talk. 
Mm. It, it's, there's a category called just talking or just oh. chatting. I think it is. Okay. Um, I don't know anything about this. So th- here's the, here's the wild thing. So destiny does just chatting, right? Mm-hmm. He'll talk or debate people. Mm. And while he's doing it, he'll oh. be playing this strategy game. I see, yeah. So he'll run rings around some of the best debaters in the mm. world whilst taking over a new planet in fucking Starcraft yeah. or some shit. It's, it's wild to see. Yeah. Um, so both of those guys are, are like relatively okay meaning examples, I think. But you do have a problem, especially if you're talking about men, that the left has mostly abandoned that conversation with them. Mm -hmm. It is so unpopular Mm -hmm. to talk about men's issues and to Mm -hmm. raise men up and to pedestalize them, masculinity uh, and traditional values in any sort of a way that any left-leaning person who wants to try and gain traction online with certain areas of the left Mm -hmm. is going to struggle to do that because as soon as you... like where is the firm place that you're going to stand Mm -hmm. in order to talk about something good from the left Mm. for men? Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as you begin to discuss anything, here's the way it works. What men want in terms of a role that can make them feel proud of themselves and what is popular to talk about in many left-leaning circles Mm -hmm. don't align. Right. You have the choice between virtue signaling the effective talking points to the left Mm -hmm. or you have things that are admiration uh, aspirational uh for men to Mm -hmm. follow and those don't cross over right and Mm. that means that the left largely has abandoned the conversation with men seems like a flaw in the matrix Uh, it's fucking something dude and here's the here's the problem like for anybody that is and there are like you know fucking half of the country is from the left Mm -hmm. anybody that is a well-meaning leftist if that was me Mm -hmm. I would be very, very unhappy at the conversation that the left is having with men because the vacuum is allowing whoever you hate the most from the right to take over this conversation. If you have a problem with Jocko Willink or David Goggins or Cameron Haynes or Andrew Tate Mm or Justin Wallet, like pick whoever your heinous example of patriarchal superstructure is, Mm -hmm. where's the alternative that you're offering? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a premise to the question because I don't see it. But like like I said, maybe I don't know. I mean, I don't know Twitch, yeah. but I don't see any, I see a lot of, I don't know. I just don't see any males on that side that I would listen to in like, you know, I, I feel like pretty open-minded. If somebody's making sense, I'm like, okay, I can, I can see where they're coming from. I don't see it. I mean, I don't see it on the left. I don't think that, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm missing it, but I spend a good bit of time being exposed to this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, you, is it impossible to like eating meat and shooting guns mm-hmm. whilst believing that immigration is okay and that being pro-choice is okay? Right. He was, he was an interesting thing. So Sam Harris, as a guy that kind of keeps on getting in hot water a little bit at the moment through a, a variety of different means... But I always appreciated, and I still do, that Sam is prepared to hold a bunch of views which don't align with any one party, Mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, he was anti-Trump but anti-woke. Okay. He was pro-vax but anti-lockdown. He was um, pro-free speech, but he's also, I think, Mm -hmm. pro-life. Pro-choice, sorry. Um, this means that you have all of these crossing over streams that no one is going to be happy. Like you're going to piss off both sides right. with your centrist opinion, which right. falls both ways right. on different topics. You can be weaponized on both <clears throat> from both sides. Dude, the, yeah. the best way to guarantee disagreement mm-hmm. is to not be in an extreme. If you're right. out on the extreme, you guarantee agreement from at least one side. Yeah. But if you're in the middle, you guarantee disagreement from both. Mm-hmm. And the problem that you come up against is that he kind of becomes an unreliable ally, mm. right? If I know that you are the cookie cutter leftist, every single view, I know one of your views. And from that, I can accurately predict everything else that you believe. Mm-hmm. I don't need to assess you. I know that you're a trustworthy ally right. because I know that you hold every single belief and you're easy to predict. Mm-hmm. But if you're someone that falls left and right on a variety of different topics, well, fuck knows what you're going to, what about when the next social issue arises? Right. Maybe you're not going to be with us. Mm-hmm. Here's another thing that I realized that an absurd ideological belief is a show of fealty to your own side and it's a threat display to the other. Hmm. So let's say that uh, in order to be on the left, you needed to believe that the earth was flat. Right. right? Let's just say. Okay. What you're saying is 
I put the value of this ideology so high that I'm prepared to push reality and my own senses to the side mm -hmm. in service of this. Mm. So it's like a, a show of loyalty, right? I'm pushing my own rationality out of the way in order to uh, be loyal to this group and this mm -hmm. movement. So it is a, a show of fealty. It's like, I don't mm -hmm. know, like a branding exercise almost. Mm -hmm. And it's the same on both left and right. And what that means is that you can judge the commitment of certain people to a movement mm -hmm. by the ridiculousness of the belief that they're prepared to swallow. Right. And yeah. if they're not prepared to swallow it, then, well, maybe you're not actually that trustworthy of an ally. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like, like it wouldn't, uh, Trump people be, couldn't they be categorized as that? Because they would say, um, they will take Trump and all his fault flaws to support that side. Right. I mean, they're, they're because he says some crazy stuff. I mean, yeah, you can say, well, he produced and he did a great job leading the country and all this he said some crazy stuff. But because you're aligned here, you're going to just absorb all that and just deal with it. Correct. Right? Yeah. You, you would be prepared to give um, Trump or Biden a degree of freedom that you wouldn't show mm -hmm. to the other side. Right. You know, like you have to treat if you want to be a rational being, you have to mm -hmm. treat each uh, situation with as much rationality as you can find, mm -hmm. right? And you go, okay, well, if I'm going to let, let's say, how many Trump gaffes and uh, like sexist outbursts mm -hmm. is worth a Biden alzheimic slip up? Yeah, or you know? shitting his pants. Yeah, like how <laughs> how 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 do you how are you yeah. supposed to do that? I know but you would work. happily point out the other side's flaws yeah. and forgive your own. Mm -hmm. This is just the nature of biases, right? Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fine mm -hmm. for you to say that I, well, I've got my priors, but yeah. then you can't step into the situation and say, coming from a place of reasonable rationality, yeah. I have morally reasoned that this is the way that it's like. No, no, no. it's not. It's yeah. not. You are you are a biased individual, as is everybody. But don't claim that you're not. Do you think it's getting worse in that regard, or it, has it always been like? this no it's it's the political polarization the data seems to suggest that it's getting worse mm -hmm. and the a bunch of different reasons for it one that i found which is really really interesting everyone talks about echo chambers online right, right? so you yeah. um, start to engage with a particular type of content and then the algorithm feeds you more and more of that content mm -hmm. i had a guy called uh he wrote Human Compatible, Dr. Stuart Russell. He literally wrote the book, the textbook, which is used in nearly 80 languages worldwide to mm. teach people about how AI works. Okay. He wrote this book about the alignment problem, which is how do you get computer systems to effectively align with what you actually want them to do? Mm. So there's a, a thought experiment called the Paperclip Maximizer. Have you heard of this? No. I Fucking brilliant. So this dude Of course called, I haven't. I carry a rock. That's all I do. Well, you might have learned about paperclips while you were <laughs> carrying the rock. I don't know. Um, you could imagine that a paperclip company manages to create a super intelligent artificial general intelligence, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Let's just go with me. Okay. Uh, and Nick Bostrom from the Future of Humanities Institute in Oxford gives this example where he says, the programmer gave it one function and he mm -hmm. said, make as many paper clips as possible. In presume yeah. that seems like a pretty good idea for a paperclip company to give to its new super right. intelligent AGI. Now the problem is that the AGI realizes, well, first off, if I'm switched off, I can't make as many paper clips as possible. Mm -hmm. So immediately it neutralizes all of the people that work in the factory. Mm -hmm. Says if they stop me from making as many paper clips, I won't make as many paper clips. Right. So <clears throat> Everybody's tranquilized. Then it realizes that all of the atoms that make up the planet Earth mm -hmm. could be used to become paperclips. Mm. So it just turns the entire Earth into paperclips. And then it realizes that all of the matter in the entire universe should be paperclips. Now, I, the function of make us as many paperclips as possible mm -hmm. wasn't quite aligned with what we wanted. Right. So herein you can see this incompatibility problem. It's called the yeah. alignment problem. Okay. And one of the issues that Stuart brings up in human compatible is with uh, the algorithms that optimize social media content. Mm -hmm. There's two ways that you can increase the amount of click through that you get on a social media platform. One is to make the content that you serve to people ever more accurate based on their preferences, mm -hmm. right? So I, that's where the echo chamber thing comes yeah. from. Now, the other way to do it is to reprogram the preferences of the user to make them more predictable. Mm. Explain that. So you could imagine that if I am able to shift your preferences ever mm -hmm. so slightly over time, mm -hmm. 
I can know what you are going to want mm -hmm. more easily. Right. If you are someone that falls left of center on one view and right of center on another, that's actually quite hard to predict mm -hmm. in the same way that we said before, you're like this unreliable ally. Yeah. Whereas if I can push you all the way out to this cookie cutter version of left or right mm -hmm. or, you know, libertarian or authoritarian or whatever, it's very easy for me to predict what you're going right. to want. So there is a two-way street going on with algorithms. One mm -hmm. is it is trying to predict what you want, but the other is it's trying to repurpose and reprogram your yeah. preferences to make you easier to predict. Right. And I think that that really explains a good part of what's going on. The social media algorithms have an incentive to push people out to the edges mm -hmm. because they're easy to predict when they're there. Yeah. Once you're in there, social reinforcement mechanisms encourage you to behave in a way that is going to be uh, applauded by your mm -hmm. side. That usually means the most extreme, low resolution take. Like nobody really gets rewarded for nuance on the internet. Right. Um, and then once you are there, you use the other side as a tribal sort of threat display mm -hmm. thing. Like we are not them. We will bind ourselves together over yeah. the mutual hatred of that out group. Um, and yeah, that pushes people to either side. It means that it's even more difficult to speak across the aisle. And finally, any show of... <clears throat> nuance or subtlety mm -hmm. in your viewpoint <coughs> um it's, it's seen as a weakness mm -hmm. it's seen as a chink in your armor hmm. yeah from I the mean, other side they say oh so mm -hmm. maybe you're not quite as committed right as we thought you were it's the whole premise behind clickbait on articles right i mean there, it's extreme that's just a, a one sentence or a few word example of extremism for whatever the point is, left, right, or whatever. It's just like, here's what you want. Here's what's important. I mean, take it. Yep. And yeah, it, that, that, uh, so I was thinking about that as you were talking and this is kind of interesting is America, the capital of podcasting. I mean, is, you know, there's talking about, uh, America is, people consider us being elitist sometimes, you know, pro what our country, whatever, I guess. I, I thought everybody was like that. Every country was like that. But maybe I need to ask you, why, why did you move here? Why did you move to Austin to podcast? Or can people podcast in other countries? Or what is it? Why is it? Is it? Do I only see American podcasts? Or are there, is there some African podcast I don't know about this is killing it? Uh, probably, I think. The UK and the US and Canada and Australia are leading the way with regards to this just because <clears throat> they've got the best access to language, especially when it comes to podcasting, right? Access to language. Well, they, mm -hmm. they speak English as their first language. Okay. You yeah. know, it's going to be very difficult for someone who is uh, French, right, to be as effective on a podcast that can access all of the people that speak English. I as, guess I don't know. What is the percentage of breakdown of language? How many I think of the Chinese, world? I think Chinese is the most used language. Okay. Or it'll be English and Chinese will be first and second. Okay. Um, and then probably something around Indian, you know, subcontinentally type stuff. Yeah. But uh, the reason that I moved out here is I really like the community aspect that Austin has. Everyone's a, a cultural refugee from somewhere else. They were mm -hmm. super open to me. But more than that, the for all that America is a you know disgusting cis hetero patriarchal superstructure that's capitalistically keeping everybody down, mm -hmm. you guys have an amazing positive attitude to life, mm -hmm. and the blue sky vision that the American dream now is like the after effect of that. Perhaps you know, like from the eighties and nineties, where it was like really, really fucking potent. Yeah, still exists. You know, I I face some challenge with regards to work um, and. All of my friends that live in Austin will just tell me, dude, you got this. Like, mm -hmm. here's 15 reasons why this is going to be absolutely fine. And here's mm -hmm. five solutions for you. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that there aren't people like that in the UK, but I met, like I say, about a million people, right, over a, year, a decade and a half. And I managed to, from them, distill down a very, very small group of friends. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really wish that I could gift people in the UK the level of positivity and uh, the like inclination that you guys have over here, hmm. that blue sky vision, um, very pro-social, very hmm. outgoing, uh, prepared to deal with things. Uh, why is it, why do you think it's different? 
There's a number of reasons. I mean, where does culture come from is like just a generally an interesting question. Mm -hmm. The UK is waterlocked on all sides and mm -hmm. it's quite small. The population mm -hmm. density is super high. So there is a high level of competition and sort of zero sumness. Like you see somebody else's success as, as detracting right. from yours because there's just less to go around. I see. Um, that pioneer spirit doesn't exist. You know, our countries exist. It is, dude, there's trees in our country that are older than your country. Right. And yeah. It just means that there's less new stuff, new ground to break. Mm -hmm. um, the weather makes a huge impact. I think it's really cold and really miserable most of the year. Mm. And it, it genuinely impacts people's demeanor. Right. Um, there's a whole, a whole host of reasons, but I wish that it wasn't that way. Right. And it's one of the things that I really appreciate about being out here. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, I'll get checked in on by Huberman or whoever, like about what's been going on or yeah. just like a, a like a, a well-meaning message about something mm -hmm. which I, was rarer to find in the uk there is right. still even the best most growth-minded people in the world you know stephen bartlett this guy that's got a big show we're buddies and true geordie also another guy with a big show mm -hmm. like even us i find we communicate despite the fact that we're like you know the british wing of podcasting yeah. or whatever even we communicate less than uh, some of the guys that i deal with in the us huh. just because you you're more forthcoming some would yeah. say some would say uh like um overly excitable but <laughs> like i like it i really really like it i i've the excitability of america is like something that i very much appreciate mm. i have this big stiff idiot of a housemate zach and he's like this six foot four 240 pound weightlifter yeah and he's just like a huge fucking alsatian all the time and he's really really good for me he's a very good influence what's an alsatian like a dog Oh, okay. <laughs> You're like a fucking big, fluffy, excitable dog. I gotcha. Okay. Right. Yeah, I guess I didn't know that breed. Um, yeah, I I was wondering about that, just thinking about, it seems like all the podcasts I know of are America-based, of course, would, would make sense, but I just didn't know how the how it worked. But that that is interesting. Um and you're at the end of the Oregon Trail. Speaking of pioneer spirit, here we are, right? Oregon. What's the Oregon Trail? That's how they came over. And they explored the new, new Lewis and Clark. Have you ever heard of Lewis and Clark? Anyway, those are the people, the explorers that came over here on the Oregon Trail and discovered this land. So, dude, I was, I was driving through uh, New Orleans, uh, driving to New Orleans um, three or four years ago. And uh, I couldn't believe, I mean, you look at the fucking landscape that you guys had to get through yeah like, navigate yeah like going mm -hmm. through the bayou okay so it's like a forest but it's underwater <laughs> yeah. and you've got to get you've just got to keep going and hope that you find something that's not totally useless at the end yeah of it. like what if this just turns into the sea right what if there's nothing on the other side of this yeah. and that's everywhere mm -hmm. and you go through pick any other extreme landscape oh it's just trees that are three feet apart for the next 200 square miles yeah and you've just got to get through them and then try and make a road and then try and make a town and then try and get people to go there yeah no. it's fucking insane not for the faint of heart no no um i was also thinking about this too when i was thinking about your journey um how much would you attribute joe rogan to you starting your podcast did you listen to him before you had a podcast massively yeah okay yeah he was he was very influential for yeah. for me i think you know Anybody that's in this sort of a space mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't been influenced by Joe is an outlier. Mm -hmm. The guy has pioneered an awful lot of the way that podcasting is done. He's an incredibly benevolent person to have at the top. And it's not usually that way. The person that accumulates all of the power and all of the influence is not usually prepared to give it away right. very quickly. Yeah. To step to one side and then allow other people to shine three or four times a week yeah and not make it about them right uh and we're we're very very fortunate uh, that that's the case right now and there is a part of me <clears throat> that i don't know is i wonder who comes next i wonder mm -hmm. who takes that mantle next because you know if we beat the odds two for two mm -hmm. that the next person is equally benevolent and good-willed and good-natured and all the rest of it yeah fucking hell like that would be a surprise so yeah. maybe we do end up with like some absolute tyrant dick that now takes over the podcasting crown in however many decades rogan stops doing it right but no he's hugely influential man i used to listen to him I, I told you yesterday about this drive that i used to do from manchester to newcastle right. which was heading the, home after the bar correct yeah. yeah so you know i'd do 
I'd accumulate, you know, 30,000, 40,000 miles a year of driving mm -hmm. almost all on my own. Uh, and I would be listening to whoever it was, you know, episodes six, 700 was probably when I started listening to Joe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man, I've spent, you know, thousands of hours listening to that guy. Yeah. And then you sit down with him and it's just the same experience that you've had before. It is one of the easy things, I suppose, about having listened to someone so much that you sit down and you have a conversation. You go, oh, I kind of yeah, know where this is going. Right. Like I've got an insight here. Yeah. Is a, okay, so there's a category of people, and I would put you in there. What is an intellectual? Mm. You know, people mm. say, they'll say Jordan Peterson or Brett Weinstein or Sam Harris. They're intellectuals. What is that? Mm. Uh, people that think deeply about stuff, I suppose. There's no mm -hmm. reason that I wouldn't put Rogan in that category as well. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that he does a lot. People look at intellectual as a, a thinker, not a doer. Mm -hmm. But Joe thinks a lot. He also just does a lot. Yeah. And the same would go for a Goggins. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he mentioned it on the podcast. He didn't put it in the book. I wonder whether if he does a third book, whether he'll talk about this. He's got this like suite, or I think he calls it a garage of garage yeah. of um 20 <laughs> you or whilst he's earlier i whilst, caught that yeah i caught it you like it you said it you're obsessed with whilst <laughs> i've strange. never heard it it's you're awesome. screaming it we tried to go for dinner yesterday and you were screaming it at the top of your lungs <laughs> I, I don't know about screaming yeah, yeah I, that was what was happened the, the server came over and I said sir yeah, i need you just... to stop shouting that word um i think that it's people that think deeply about problems mm -hmm. is how i would look at it it's mm -hmm. the most like broad definition that I could think of. But I really like the idea of this uh, doer philosopher mm -hmm. situation, you know, somebody that doesn't just think about stuff, but then goes out and acts it. And you right. go back to the ancient Greeks that they didn't think you were supposed to just consider, you were supposed to act, you know, mm -hmm. you were supposed to wrestle, you were supposed to uh, feel the extremes that your body could go to mm -hmm. as well. And doing hard things mentally is good, but doing hard things physically benefits that. And they complement each other maybe? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You know, there was an article, I, I, I can't remember what was, it was in the New York Times, I'm not sure, but it was called The Intellectual Dark Web. Do you remember that article? Yeah, yeah. And who they, who they put in there? Mm -hmm. That's where I was like, what is an intellectual really? You know, and what's this dark web? It's like, um, what do you think about that piece? Yeah, I think it's interesting now because it's kind of like a a loose, that was a, a, a loose um, conglomeration of certain individuals that mm -hmm. had a good amount of clout within the thinking, talking space. And now the band has broken up and none of them are friends, really. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of them that are still friends, but basically none of them are. It was uh, Brett Weinstein, uh, Eric Weinstein, Sam Harris, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Rogan was in there, Douglas Murray was in there, Claire Lehman, maybe Barry Weiss. Uh, I think Dave Rubin was in there. And now like half of the people don't speak to half of the people. Yeah. And a bunch of the people don't speak to any of the people. So <clears throat> when that came together, it was a cultural moment that was needed because you had to have a show there is a way that certain individuals who do not necessarily disagree, do not necessarily agree with regards to their politics can have a well-meaning conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And this was the height of woke, you know, it was kind of just before BLM and everything kicked off. And you needed to be able to show Ben, who is as conservative as they come, and Brett, who was from the left, and Jordan, who was a little bit more centrist, and Dave Rubin, who used to be on the left, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You had all of these different people within yeah. Sam Harris, who's, who's, you know, sort of swings both ways. They were all able to have a conversation. And the point of that was to try and turn down the volume of the conversation, this, you know, partisan echo chamber, right versus left thing that was going on. Mm -hmm. And um, for whatever reason, that experiment didn't end up going particularly well in the long term. It was effective in the short term. Yeah. But the fact that it still sticks about is really interesting to me. And I'm not really too sure why, like, you know, that was one article. Nobody, as far as I'm aware, unironically self-referred to themselves as like this Avengers freaking right. group of yeah. intellectuals. Right. And then it kind of, you know, pitted out within the space of 18 months or mm -hmm. something. Hmm. Uh, and, and it was never really used that much during the 18 months in any case. And yet it's still spoken about to this day. Yeah. So there was something culturally important about that. Whether you agree with the people or not, whether you liked it or not, whether you thought it was cringe or not, 
you can't deny that it's stuck about as a term. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's something interesting about that. I, I'm not really too sure why it's the case, but it was needed to just turn down the volume of the conversation. What, why do you think that they were to, now they're not as tight as they were? Like some of the people you mentioned. It's beyond what not happened? as tight as they were, man. I mean, Sam, in a couple of most recent episodes, he did one with Josh Seps, and he's had a couple of others where he just outright calls out <clears throat> uh, Dave Rubin for being like, a dense idiot he says that brett weinstein he you know he can't speak to him anymore he's like this person's lost his mind and that person's and sam's kind of a burn it all down yeah socially kind of guy because he's got his own thing going on and, mm -hmm. and he's like an individual with regards to that um i think one of the problems that you had there was the, ostensibly what was supposed to happen with the IDW was people were uh, from differing points of view were prepared to have conversations where they all disagreed and mm -hmm. that happened but it only happened up to a point mm -hmm. and then a combination of Trump and COVID right. pushed the limits of how much these people could disagree and, and still be on the same page yes yeah. precisely yeah. And, and the problem that you had was whenever you set yourself up as being um, as having a particular standard. So for instance, with David Goggins or yourself, right? You guys have positioned yourselves as the do hard things people, mm -hmm. right? And then if somebody finds out that the do hard things people continue to shy away from doing hard things, they'll go, ah, I got yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I got you, you prick. Flaw. That's your hypocrisy, mm -hmm. yes. And one of the issues you had with the IDW especially was that it was the, we talk about things that nobody else can talk about in a well-meaning way, people. Mm -hmm. So as soon as there started to be cracks and splinters in that, I see. that was the hypocrisy that got pointed out. I see. Uh, even if, you know, they might have maybe come together had they have not had so much scrutiny on them, I kind of get the impression that it was doomed from the, from the start. Mm -hmm. um, but he was one other thing that I realized that was really interesting. This is from uh, The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. And he talks about why people love scandal so much mm. and this is certainly something that i see online as well hypocrisy is like catnip to the mm -hmm. internet right and the reason that i think that that's the case is that if you call out somebody else's hypocrisy or their uh, lack of ability to keep to their promises mm -hmm. what you do the subtext of what you're saying is i would never yeah i would me I would never, I would never behave like that. I stick to my word. My right. virtue is impeccable. I am the most honest and trustworthy person. So what happens is this sort of uh, performative outrage allows your morality to stand on the shoulders of somebody else. Mm -hmm. You get to feel moral whilst having done mo nothing moral to earn it. Right. And this is why I think the internet is so prepared to call out hypocrisy mm. it's like purpose built for the internet because all that you need is two clips yeah first clip someone making a preposition second clip somebody breaking it right and you go look at this look at this it, and yeah the then subtext of that is mm -hmm. i am not that I all see. of my views are perfectly aligned you don't need to worry about me but let's have a look at that person over there yeah and then if you get a reputation of being the sort of person that calls out people that do that mm -hmm. people then want to call you out on your inconsistencies yeah which is why starting fights on the internet is is <laughs> like doing outright call outs is a relatively dangerous thing to do yeah um yeah. because it's going to come back around it's open season yeah. as soon as you decide to do that it's open season you need yeah. to be incredibly strategic huberman actually had this really fucking interesting take i put it in my newsletter this week mm -hmm. and um if anyone wants to check that out, by the way, there's a, a reading list of a hundred books that I absolutely love. And you can get that at chriswillex.com slash books. But I put this, uh, this quote in from Huberman. He's a really interesting guy because he kind of purposefully avoids, um, drama. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Comment, and yeah. He, he, he doesn't really even engage in talking about why he avoids drama, but he, he's always positive. I yeah. mean, if he's talking about anybody, there's always a positive spin to it. It's sickening, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Advice I got early in my career, don't overengage in any controversy unless you are willing to stake your entire reputation on it. Mm -hmm. Rather, keep focused on discovering new things and creating or else you become known for the controversy and nothing else. There is no going back. Right. Do you want to be known for the things that you do mm -hmm. or do you want to be known for the takes you have? Right. Exactly. I want yeah. to be known for the things that I do. I think the people who, who choose uh, for the takes is they're not doing anything noteworthy, right? Wouldn't that be the argument? Well, it's very easy to do that. Yeah. Now, there are people who have great takes and also do things. Yeah. Like that would be, That'd and be it's, it's impossible to be in the fucking podcasting world and be like, oh, I don't want to be known for my takes. It's like, dude, you are yeah. your takes. Yeah. 
But on the flip side, if someone is able to both do and think at the same time, mm -hmm. that's that's good. Yeah, Huberman is a man. He's a unicorn too. As I was explaining this yesterday, is like normally people as smart as him, they're nerd out. I don't. I can't understand what two nerds talking to each other are saying, but he talks at my level, it seems like about smart things. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense to me somehow. I don't know how, but it's because of how he's delivering it. It's a, it, it's a, that's a skill that man, not everybody has, especially, you know, what, uh, what is he a neuroscientist? Uh, yeah. I think that's his qualification from Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. And so he came here and lifted weights like a dumbass like me. And that was kind of cool. How can somebody be both? Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. You learn about ophthalmology or whatever it is that his specialty is in and they yeah. come in here and crush you on yeah. deadlifts. I know. But that's, you know, th this is what attracts people. And this is why as well, I think that shows like Joe's and, and hopefully mine and yours are interesting and attractive because most people aren't just interested in one thing. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't just a neuroscientist. They aren't just a weightlifter. They aren't just a film nerd. Yeah. You know, they're, they're idiosyncratic. They've got tons of different interests Layers, and yeah. things that they want to, maybe they've got like a, a secret ultimate Frisbee like obsession or mm -hmm. something. They just love watching motocross uh, accidents or whatever in YouTube. Like one of my friends says, if you want to find out who somebody truly is, look at their YouTube watch history between the hours of 10 PM and 11 PM at night. <laughs> okay. like that's, that's a window into the soul that yeah. you're never going to get. Yeah. Um, it, people are interested in lots of things, which means that when you see someone, which is multifaceted as well, like mm -hmm. a Huberman, you go, Oh yeah. Like he's like me. He's not just one thing. He's competent in multiple things. He's got mm -hmm. lots of different interests. Uh, and that's why I think, you know, shows that, um, facilitate those sorts of conversations are effective as well. It's to me, it's inspiring because, you know, you can say somebody's good at this one thing. It's just like, well, that's all they do. But when they are multifaceted and they're varied and they offer different skills and, and can communicate effectively, then you're like that to me, that's inspiring. It's like, I want to be like that. Yeah. I want to be the dumb ass that carries rocks, but I also want to be able to write and impact people. Yep. And, and, uh, I, that to me, that's why he's, he's inspiring. Um, who, who inspires you to, you know, obviously Rogan, but to step up your game. I mean, where do you think you're impacted most by who? Joe was definitely a big Im impact on me. Mm -hmm. Um, I did, I take stuff from everybody. I mean, Sam, for all that he is like very, very unpopular at the moment with a lot of corners of the internet, because he's had like a three or two or three, like big fucking foot in mouth moments. Mm -hmm. or at least that's what he's being accused yeah, of. I think yeah. he stands behind what he said. Right. Um, his ability to speak is as elite as it gets. Mm -hmm. The clarity that he speaks with, the precision that he speaks with is world-class. And I'm yet to find really anybody, him, Peterson, they're so fucking precise man. And, yeah. and, and that's something that I very much admire. And we've been speaking about some of the like training that I've done to try and yeah. improve. Well, my... I, I put you in there too, because every time I see you, every clip I see of you, I'm just like, God dang, this guy's polished. <laughs> I mean, you. so whatever you're doing. But so is Andrew Tate, man. Andrew Tate's ability to communicate regardless yeah. of what you think about the things that he says, the way that he says it mm -hmm. is fucking elite. Yeah. That guy's verbal agility is phenomenal. It is. And that's one of the, you know, let's say that you're somebody that doesn't agree with his takes, right? Mm -hmm. Even a little bit or a lot. Um, what Tate has identified is your ability to speak in a fluent and seductive manner mm -hmm. can carry you a hell of a long way. Right. And especially in a world where everybody feels quite uncertain, mm -hmm. if you speak in absolutes, mm -hmm. that creates a little bit of order from chaos. Because for me, uh, I'm sure for you as well, <clears throat> the world's <clears throat> the world's changing very quickly. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether the rules from yesterday apply to today. Technology's changed everything. Society's changed everything. Laws and norms and everything's up in the air. So when somebody comes along and says, this is the way it is, right. I can give you a black and white explanation mm -hmm. of why, of how, of what. I can tell you everything. You go, oh, fuck, thank God, thank God. I'm not this certain about anything in my life. Right. Therefore, 
in order for me to have the level of certainty that he does, I would have to know everything inside out. Mm -hmm. You know, you observe your own hesitancy from a front row seat every right. single day. Right. And then you see this person come out and say, I've got the answer. Yeah. And you go, fuck, he's got the answer. Like, I'm, I, it, it, he has to be Finally, right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and that's why I think that he's particularly been effective. But mm -hmm. dude, I, you know, I'm a, a real uh, admirer. Tim Dillon, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That guy's ability to tell stories. Incredible. Um, like Chris D'Elia as well. You know, he's someone that's, again, is going through the ringer a little bit at the moment too. But that guy does solo podcasts with nobody else in the room and maintains a level of energy for 60 minutes or 90 minutes. And you're like, yeah. holy fuck. It's incredible. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And it, these guys are performers, but they're all different. You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, can that be learned? I mean, it certainly has think? been for me. Certainly has been the yeah. difference. The difference between when I started my show and now is, is worlds apart. Yeah. Um, and it's layers of paint, mm. you know, it's 600, it's probably a thousand hours over the last five years of trying to have conversations about hard things. As, as a kid, you couldn't communicate very well. So I was always like gobby, we would call it in the UK, mm. like talkative. Um, but <clears throat> I didn't have anyone really to talk to, you know, I was playing in my room on my own, listening to audiobooks. Yeah. Uh, there's this really cool story about a, a famous color picker. So she was, um, used by interior design companies, elite interior design companies and fashion houses to create color wheels, right? Mm -hmm. So these beautiful color palettes mm -hmm. uh, of, um, different shades that complement each other. And there was this interview with her and she was asked how, how have you managed to develop this incredibly unique skill to become the most sought after person in the world at this? She said, well, I've got no formal training. <clears throat> I've got no formal training. Mm. However, my parents, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, got me the biggest Crayola crayon set that was mm. available. And I used yeah. every single one of them down to the, the end. Yeah. And I think a lot of the passions that we have when we're a kid come back around mm -hmm. to be the things that we want to do when we're an adult. Mm. And for me, uh, a lot of it was audiobooks. So I'd be in my room on my own listening to them. And you roll the clock forward by 20 years and what's the 2023 equivalent of an audiobook? Yeah, podcast. podcast. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it can absolutely be learned when I mm. see the difference in, in myself from uh, just the time and attention of doing stuff, uh, focused work on trying to be precise mm -hmm. with your speech. And it's made everything better. It's made my social anxiety less. Mm -hmm. uh, it's meant that I'm able to um, be more me. Mm -hmm. You know, your ability to communicate in a large degree determines other people's experience of you. Mm. You know, you can be whatever you feel you are. There's an essence, right? Mm -hmm. There's like this sort of cloud that is you. Yeah. But that needs to get squeezed into language. Mm -hmm. Some sort of communication, unless you're going to do sign language or something, or fucking right. interpretive dance. Mm -hmm. Like you need to communicate what is inside of you to everybody else that's around you. Language, yeah. And for the most part, language mm -hmm. is going to constrain that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Wittgenstein that says, the limits of my language mean the limits of my life. I see. And the broader your vocabulary, the more precise that you can put across what it is that's inside of your head, mm -hmm. whether that be written or spoken or whatever, hmm. you, you, you are more yourself. Mm-hmm. If you can say that there is a restriction between what's in your mind and what comes out of your mouth, you're being less you. You're right. bringing an imprecise version of you. Do, so, do people who can't get that out their mouth, could they be a good writer though? Perhaps, yeah. yeah. But even that, you know, you need, there has to be a way that you can communicate it, whether mm -hmm. it's from brain to hand, brain yeah. to fingertips, brain to mouth, you have to be able to communicate it. And if you can't, you're going to go through life living this limited version mm -hmm. of you uh, it might be tormented because if your mind is saying, telling you one thing, but you can't get it out in word or 100%. in, in length and writing. Yeah. 100%. That, that would be miserable. Did you write as a kid? Did no. you write? No? no, I did. I did five years at uni. I did two degrees, both of which were useless yeah. uh, and neither of which I can remember, but I didn't write for any other reason. Now I do a newsletter, that thing I said earlier on. Yeah. Um, and I love it. It's mm. maybe 90 minutes a week. It takes me to two, uh, two hours a week. <clears throat> I absolutely love it. Yeah. I love I love sitting down and writing and going through. Yeah, it's great. It, I haven't seen. Is it your thoughts on yeah, different so, topics? Yeah. So I do um, maybe five hundred word reflection on something that I've learned mm. uh, each week. This week was about the effectiveness of sexual gossip uh, mm. between women, like why they use it so much. So women gossip way more than men. 
right loads more than men mm. the interesting thing about sexual gossip is that it it is a precision targeted weapon to reduce down the competition that other women see in their competitors mm -hmm. so um amongst women chastity is something that is valued by men right, right? that on average you want yeah. a mate that is less promiscuous than mm -hmm. one that isn't because of male parental uncertainty you need to make sure that the kid that comes out of that woman is yours therefore if you have a woman who is um sexually less open you would presume that there is yeah. a greater likelihood now the thing and about that's subconscious correct right. none of this is none of this is front of brain mm -hmm. um no one's reverse engineering this apart from the evolutionary psychologists that I have on my show who have yeah. like, you know, laid this all out. Right. Um, but the thing about sexual gossip, the person that deploys the sexual gossip is by first off identifying, oh, I'm, I'm really worried about Mary because she's spending all of this time with guys. And I, I'm just really worried that she's going to get hurt. That is a very caring way. It's called venting. Mm. Um, it's a very caring way to put across. Mary's a whore. Don't yeah. go near her. Right. But the other thing it does is it uh, displays your own chastity. Mm. The subtext mm -hmm. of I'm, she's Feel going to get hurt is precise. Yeah. yeah. And it's very difficult to disprove. How are you like, look at all of the sex I'm not having. Like sex is inherently <laughs> right. private. So right. anyway, like I did 500 words on that and then I'll uh, have three lessons that I learned each week, which I put on my Instagram, which you might've seen before. So that gets taken actually from the, from the newsletter. But just building up this variety of outlets to repurpose the shit that you learn is brilliant. You where, know, where did you learn that about women? I mean, where'd that writings come from? That was a conversation I had with Dr. Tanya Reynolds, mm. who is an evolutionary psychologist focused on intrasexual competition from the University, University of New Mexico. Okay. I had her on a couple of weeks ago. She was great. Um, and I'll just, you know, each week I'll have a conversation. I'm like, fucking hell, that's great. Yeah, About just reflect this, on it. Precisely. Right, okay. And it's the, the Feynman technique of mm. memorization is the best way to learn something is to teach somebody else it. Hmm. Uh, so my training partners that I have in Austin, like my housemate or whatever, I'll usually read for maybe like 15 minutes or 20 minutes on a morning. Yeah. Then whoever it is, is going to get it. Whatever I've read that morning, I'm going <laughs> to try and for five minutes while we're in the car on the way there, before we put rock music on to get a sample. We'll talk about it. I'm going to try and tell them. And it just okay. means that it, it's such a, an unbelievably good way. Hmm. You know, even that, even trying to explain about the sexual gossip thing now, that's just, yeah refined it a little bit more right, in my mind. Tighten it up. Yeah. And yeah. You know how we were talking at the start about performance without purpose. Mm -hmm. Learning without purpose mm -hmm. is quite difficult. Why am I why would I go through all of the discomfort of learning all of this stuff mm -hmm. if I wasn't going to have an outlet to to display it on? Right. Okay. You know, you, sheer you have curiosity. Yeah. You have Plus your incentive is you want to be able to share it. Yeah. To your, to your listeners. Yeah. So having yeah. a platform in that regard can actually be one of the best vehicles for personal learning right. that you can have. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. How I used to learn in college and I would go through, I would just, I would have to write everything. So I, I could read it. What, that'd be one thing. But if I wrote exactly what I read, writing it cemented it in my Same brain. As me. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, exactly the same as me. I would take whatever the thing was I was learning, the slides or the book. Yeah. write it out on paper and then I would learn it off by heart. Mm -hmm. So let's say I had eight pages and I would read through all of it and then close my eyes and try and remember every single point. And then once I'd done that one, I'd move on to the next one. Yeah. And then when I got into the exam and some question about an accounting principle came up, I'd be like, right, okay, I know that's on the th one, two, three, yeah. third page, top of the third page. Oh, and that was the one where the asterisk was like a little bit fucked. So I had to do yeah. it again. Yeah. 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 And I, so for me, I didn't really learn anything. I just kind of memorized for a short period of time, get through the test. Correct. Good to go. Correct. Now I have no idea what even anything was. Me and you both. <laughs> I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on masculinity. And I, this book, Wild at Heart by John Eldridge, is a book uh, Michael Chandler talked about. And he had a, a great quote in there. It's on, on my podcast there. But um, we spoke about this yesterday. And I, I wanted to get your thoughts on masculinity and how men in society these days. But let me read this paragraph to you. Again, out of Wild at Heart, this is page 38 by John Eldridge. This wonderful, terrible creature should have been out roaming the savannah, ruling his pride, striking fear into the heart of every wildebeest, bringing down zebras and gazelles whenever the urge seized him. Instead, he spent every hour of every day, of every night, of every year alone, in a cage smaller than your bedroom. His food served to him through a little metal door. 
Sometimes late at night, after the city had gone to sleep, I would hear his roar come down from the hills. It sounded not so much fierce, but rather mournful. During all of my visits, he never looked me in the eye. I desperately wanted him to. Wanted for his sake the chance to stare me down. Would have loved it if he took a swipe at me. But he just lay there, weary with that deep weariness that comes from boredom, boredom, taking shallow breaths, rolling now and then from side to side. For years after living in a cage, a lion no longer believes it is a lion, and a man no longer believes he is a man. So it's the it's creating this link between a, a lion in a zoo and a man living a, a existence of boredom in a house. So, um, what's your thoughts on masculinity, and and why is that why? Tate's message of what being a man is, is resonating so much because so many people are like that lion in the zoo with no feeling, no purpose or not knowing what, what the role is. What do you think? I think that definitely contributes to it. Yeah. I think that <clears throat> finding a firm place for masculinity to stand is very difficult mm -hmm. in 2023. Uh, one which is publicly applauded, which personally feels fulfilling, which aligns with you know, some biological predispositions that you have, which isn't going to be accused as being toxic, which isn't actually perhaps dangerous to the people that are around you, whether they be, you know, other citizens or women specifically. Like it's, it's a difficult needle to thread with yeah. all of these different things. And for someone like Tate to come in and say, I have the answer. It's traditional roles. It's masculine dominance. It's prestige. It's success monetarily with women, sexually, you know, it's seductive because it's a kind of a low resolution view, mm -hmm. but it's one that aligns with what a lot of men kind of feel inside of them. Mm -hmm. Now, there aren't many men that are traditionally masculine that have said, this isn't the way that men are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. What they've said is that this is an uncivilized way for men to be. Mm -hmm. Like this doesn't align with what society in a, a developed world is supposed to behave. Right. This is like going back to a more ancestral view, mm -hmm. um, a dog eat dog kind of world. Now, the problem that you have with masculinity at the moment is, as we've said, there are very few proposals for what masculinity can be, which is agreed on by all sides. Mm -hmm. Like, tell me, tell me one principle which would be agreed on by both left and right. Let's say one that should be agreed on by both sides would be something like bravery or courage, mm -hmm. right? Like the ability to protect, preserve, provide. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems like you could be pandering to women. Are women not able to protect themselves now? Why right. do they need protecting? Maybe yeah. it should be men that shouldn't be so predatory that women don't need to be protected in the first place. Mm -hmm. What about provide? Well, you're telling me that women can't earn their own economic independence. Oh, you want women to stop going to university. You want women to stop being in the workplace. You want women to just be domestic prostitutes. Right. No. Like there is a way for anybody on the internet to find a problem mm -hmm. with any proposal of masculinity right now. Hmm it's not the same necessarily with femininity. Right. And, you know, biologically and reproductively, women are more valuable than men. Mm -hmm. As it's called, women are uh, genetics playthings. You have more geniuses and you have more retards mm -hmm. with men. Like, that's actually what happens. The average IQ is the same, but the distribution is much wider. Mm. So you have super geniuses and you have guys that lose. You have more men that are CEOs, but you have more men that kill themselves or go to prison. You right. have you know, more male superstar athletes, but mm -hmm. more men that end up being shot. So men are the playthings in that right. regard. And that makes it difficult, man. You know, yeah. you have, for all the, you could point at men that are doing incredibly well in CEO positions and say, look at how fantastic the life is that they're living. And you go, yeah, but look at the fucking bottom end of the distribution. Yeah. They're not having a great time. I, I've heard that example too. Like you're looking at a very small percentage of successful men. You know, the you say, well, some people say, well, all CEOs running multi-million dollar companies are all white men. And it's just like, so it's white men have all the advantage, but you're not looking at all the white men killing themselves or in prison. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, uh, I, I, I get people do, uh, they make a lot of assumptions. Um, I know one thing, uh, Tate does mention too, and I've, I've read this in the book in, in this book too, and it's also I, sometimes I think Tate gets a lot of his material from the Bible itself. And be um, the Quran now. Yeah, Quran, that's true. Um, 
but they talk where men, they don't so much need love. They, they want respect. Like if, if they had to choose between love and respect from their mate, from their, from their wife or their, their girlfriend, they would choose respect. And men aren't really love is whatever. Just respect me when I come home. I'm, I'm willing to die for you. If somebody broke in the house, I would die to protect you. Just respect me. And if men don't get respect, that's when they, that's when problems come up. Women need love. They want to be loved and adored and, and everything else. Men different. Um, interested in your take on that. So I had a psychotherapist called Adam Lane Smith on my podcast, and he has dealt with attachment issues and depression from both men and women for decades. Mm -hmm. He's been a, a clinical worker. And he said that male depression gets treated like female depression. Men are made to feel loved and accepted when all they want to do is feel capable and powerful. Mm -hmm. And he used this example of the Blitz in World War II. So the Germans are coming over and they're bombing London. And before the war started, there were these psychiatric wards and they had patients in. And these patients had been uh, catatonic for years, totally comatose, unresponsive. And the nurses would come in, feed them, roll them over, clean the bedpan, wash them, leave them again. Mm -hmm. These men, mostly men, had been completely unresponsive. Then the blitz starts and bombs are being dropped. And one of the problems that you had was that a lot of the men had already been taken off to war. They were already working in jobs. Uh, a lot of the women were also working, nurses, all looking after kids down in bunkers and in the underground trying to protect them from the bombs. Mm -hmm. So there were fires and there were injuries all over London and there were ambulances and fire engines and there was no one to drive them. Hmm. These men who had been catatonic for five years and a decade got up, Rose to the challenge. Put their shoes on, mm -hmm. went out, starred, and started driving fire engines and ambulances. These men that had been unresponsive for years and years and years. Because they had purpose. And that's what Adam said. Mm -hmm. Adam said that give a man a purpose and the ability to achieve it and he will crawl over broken glass with mm -hmm. a smile. Mm -hmm. And I think that feeling capable and powerful and competent and respected and admired is something that will get a man so far. Mm -hmm. You give a man those things and it, he'll deal with suffering until the ends of the earth. We're designed to do that. We're designed to suffer. We're designed to deal with that suffering, mm -hmm. but it needs to be in service of something. Yeah. You know, the man that suffers and doesn't have competence, capability, purpose, respect, meaning, admiration, that's a man that's depressed. That's a man who is alone, Mm -hmm. and, and struggling and may take his own life or may become increasingly useless to the potential partner and society around him or may become radi radicalized, you know, in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And a man who is able to do things well is useful to everybody around him. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that you have is because there is a very small but pretty vicious cohort of men who do bad things mm -hmm. to other people and women, especially um, in the same way as you said, you know, 90% of CEOs are white men, therefore mm -hmm. all white men are having it great. Yeah. You know, whatever it is like 0.1% of men or 0.05% of men or something commit uh, sexual violence acts. Therefore all men are predators. Right what you do is you smear all of masculinity with the example of its most egregious transgressors. Mm -hmm. The problem that you have there is what baby have you thrown out with the bathwater? Right. If in order to make a society where a very small cohort of men is no longer going to misbehave, you have to make all men sedated and useless. What do you want? Like yeah. what, what is it that you want? And this is a really interesting question. So um, going into my evolutionary psychology obsession at the moment, yeah. there's a, a, a dynamic called young male syndrome. And mm -hmm. young male syndrome describes a society in which there is a uh, large cohort of unmarried, childless men, usually young men. Mm -hmm. This happens sometimes if there has been selective uh, breeding, if um, women or if parents for some reason have chosen to have more male than female sons, you're seeing mm. this in Japan and China at the right. moment. 
Uh, or it could be if there has recently been some sort of catastrophe which has affected women more than men. Perhaps it was a cold snap and women were able to fend off this sort of cold a little bit uh, less effectively. And throughout history, when you have this preponderance of men, also another one would be what's called a gerontocracy, which mm. is where... Um, polygynous relationships and mating is reserved only for the older men. I see. And uh, the younger men would tend to have to go through a bunch of trials and tribulations and mm -hmm. stuff. And it's until you get to 35 that you actually are allowed to mate. What happens is the young men mate on the side in any case, but they yeah. resent the older men. Basically, you yeah. have a uh, large number of men, mm -hmm. young men. Now, when you get into a relationship as a man, your testosterone drops. When you have children, your testosterone drops again. Mm. What this means is it reduces risk-taking behavior amongst men. And this would make sense. Mm -hmm. Like if you now have to provide for first a wife and then kids, don't try and jump off that cliff and say right. you don't die. Right. Because if you leave behind some kids that aren't going to be able to fend for themselves, that's not good for your genetic line, mm -hmm. right? So men's risk-taking behavior goes down when they get into a relationship and have kids. Which testosterone means testosterone goes down. Yes. Yeah. Which means that if you don't have many married men or and or men with kids, mm -hmm. you have a greater increase in risk taking behavior and testosterone. Mm. Men who are between the ages of whatever, like seventeen and twenty eight, let's mm -hmm. say, just going around causing havoc, pushing over granny, graffitiing walls, and sometimes creating populist uprisings. Mm -hmm. right? You know, this is the the classic um, like gang mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, situation. The problem that you have at the moment is we have the highest rates of sexlessness amongst young men, I think ever in history. Mm -hmm. The number of men reporting no sex in the last year has tripled from 8% to 28% wow. from 2008 to 2018. Mm -hmm. Roll that clock forward the next four years through the pandemic. I honestly think if you see a man on the street between the ages of 18 and 30 and you pointed at him, there would be a 50% chance that he hasn't had sex in the last year. That's not good, right? What, and what, what's that, what's going to happen? What's the result of this? So most theories would suggest that you would have increasing societal instability. Mm -hmm. You'd have three things. Uh, individual happiness drops because yeah. no matter how much of a hardcore men going their own way, like red pillar you are, there is a good amount of evidence that suggests having a companion, having friends, having connections is correlated with every outcome you want. Happiness, lifespan, health span, longevity, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So people individually are going to be less happy. Societally, it should be less stable because of this young male syndrome that we've spoken about. Yeah. You have less More reason violent. to buy in. Yeah, if you're not, if you don't, if your missus isn't going to keep tabs on whether or not you're fucking up the local gardens at night or whatever with your friends because yeah. you're just like playing football or whatever it is that you decide to do. Mm -hmm. And then civilizationally, you've got birthright problems. The one that we're talking about is the societal stuff. So we know that we've got increasing rates of sexlessness amongst young men. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't seen this huge preponderance of incel killings. You know, mm -hmm. that's not to say we haven't had none, like Elliot Rogers and blah, blah, blah. Most of the killings that do happen are coming from disaffected young men. Mm -hmm. But given that we've got as yet unseen rates of sexlessness, mm -hmm. where are all of the terrorist events? Yeah. And my theory, which mm -hmm. is the male sedation hypothesis, mm. is that men are being sedated out of their status seeking and reproductive behavior mm -hmm. through porn and video games. Mm. I think that they are getting a titrated dose, just a little trickle. And medicated, didn't you? you yes, yeah, medication yeah, as well yeah. is also mm -hmm. happening. Yes. I think I saw you put that up the other day. Correct, yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's from the newsletter. 2,000 hours a year, uh, men between the ages of 18 and 30 on average pay 2,000 hours a year of video games and a good chunk of them, at least 50% of them are doing it whilst on prescription meds mm. or on weed. So young male syndrome, right? And this is a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier on. Mm -hmm. Let's say that there are two versions of the world, one in which the traditional young male syndrome of populist uprisings and, and dangerous men and stuff occurs. And the other one in which you've got my sedation hypothesis mm -hmm. going on. Given the choice between the two, I would rather have men not be causing havoc and burning down buildings, mm -hmm. but only by a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like you have got an army of useless sedated men mm -hmm. who are not contributing to society. They're not working jobs. They're not innovating. They're not driving GDP. And every year that they continue to do the things that they're doing, playing video games whilst on weed, mm -hmm. they become 
less and less of an attractive mate for the sort of partner that would yeah. drag them out of that in any case. Mm -hmm. So you have a choice here between men who are dangerous but competent mm -hmm. or sedated but useless. Yeah. Tough choices. Fucking hard, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you want do you want the risk of uprisings? Whilst you, if you do need them to do something, they're there yeah, to do it. They're available. Correct. And, and this and is prepared. The, this is the problem. You know, this is Peterson's whole thing. Like, you'd rather be a warrior in a garden than gardener in a right. war. That you need to be able to have competence and danger that you voluntarily control, mm -hmm. because a rabbit isn't by its nature good. Mm -hmm. It's simply weak. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. It, it also reminds me, I've, I've read that, you know, years ago, college educated kids were 60, 40 men to women. And now it's 70, 30 is some of the stats. So women are being more educated. Men are whatever, let, I guess, less of a, a byproduct of an, a higher education. Um, and so, yeah, we flipped that script on that and the attentions were good because, hey, have women been oppressed? Who knows? But there's a concerted effort to get more women educated, college educated, and now it's reversed. And now, I mean, it feels like, I don't know, is there an ebb and flow to everything or is, are we are we going too far with some of it? So when Title IX was introduced, which mm -hmm. was uh, to try and improve the number of female uh, college graduates that you had. That was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the percentage point gap was uh, 13 percentage points, right, between okay. uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. The gap is now 15 percentage points in the other direction. Right. Nobody, nobody at all. And I spoke to Richard Reeves, who wrote a great book that everybody should check out called Of Boys and Men. Mm -hmm. uh, he's looked at this. He's a like a policy wonk from uh, Washington, D.C., also a fellow countryman, a fellow countryman of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody thought that in... 50 years, this trend would blast through parity and swing back the other way. The other way right. Nobody yeah. thought that this was going to happen at all. So, I mean, what do you do when you have ever increasing numbers of uh, women that are going to college and university? Well, it's just, I'm, I'm just considering it with your example too. So you get the, the less capable men who, you know, that's, that's an unrelated issue, it seems like. And now the women and less men going to college also. That's like men taking a big hit. Oh, it's, dude, it's a ton of L's. It's L's everywhere for yeah. men at the moment. Structurally, the three main areas that uh, Richard looked at was education, employment, and fatherhood. Mm -hmm. um, in employment, the male labor force participation has dropped by 0.1% per month, every month since 1950. 87% in 1950, down to 68% now. And by 2040, it's going to be 65%, which will be an all-time low. Hmm. You have um, two men, as uh, three women for every two men completing a four-year US... No, in fact, it's... Yes, it is, three to two uh, for every two men completing a four-year US college degree. And, you know, is it right that we should give everybody as many opportunities as possible? Yes, absolutely. Was it the case that women's access to education and employment had been restricted for a good amount of time? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have the same level of, of opportunities. But the problem that you have is this ever-increasing cohort of high-performing women are now competing for an ever-decreasing cohort of ultra-high-performing men. Mm -hmm. You know, the stats on Tinder suggest that the bottom 80% of men compete for the bottom 20% of women mm. and the top 80% of women compete for the top 20% of men. Right. So the top 20% of men, if you do get yourself into that cohort, quite rightly a commitment to us because they've got a, just this wealth of options yeah. in front of them. So they use women mm -hmm. in, because why not? You know, men are not going to say no to many, many women. Right. These women become bitter and resentful. Mm -hmm. They retreat from dating into a boss bitch career lifestyle, which for some women is right, but I would argue on average for most women is not what they necessarily want long term. Right. This big cohort of men here down the bottom, they become uh, lonely mm -hmm. and resentful and they just retreat into porn and video games. Yeah. So it's Unhealthy. not really it's not really fantastic for anybody. No. And it's not even, I think, that fantastic for the, you know, the Andrew Tate uh like Hustlers University crowd. War room. No, I don't think that it's great for them either because like do you really want in your 50s to still be slain puss. Yeah. Like, is that really... And dude, this is my... Like, this comes full circle for me as someone that lived that mm -hmm. lifestyle, the nightlife thing, all of the 
values that I was told that society should, that I, I should care about, you know, mm -hmm. the social renown and the, all the girls knowing your name and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe for some guys that are more differently inclined than I am, that yeah. is the pinnacle of what they want. Right. But for me, it's not like, mm -hmm. you know, I look forward to having a family. I can't wait to have kids. I can't wait to be a dad. Yeah. Like I want to do that. That's part of my life path. And I don't want to have a family whilst, you know, sneaking out, even if it was with the allowance of my partner mm -hmm. to like go and what F fuck some yeah. like 25 year old yeah. bird. Like that's not, that's not what I want to do. Some people grow out of that and evidently some people don't, or maybe mm -hmm. some people kid themselves that they don't want to, but it, it's not good, man. Like it's, it's really, really concerning. And mm -hmm. I think that um, trying to find a firm place for men to stand is really, really important. Raising men up without dragging women back right. is a very difficult situation to, to get ourselves into. Well, especially given the, you said, extremes on both sides. You know, it's nobody's working together on this. It's super it's like, adversarial. It's a feminist crazy feminists and then the toxic masculinity. Correct. And so the, coming up with a solution is almost impossible with those two camps. I mean, how's it going to work? But um, so are you feeling pressure yourself to find a mate, to find somebody? So I've got, I, I'm, I'm in a relationship okay. and uh, I, I very much enjoy the like calm peace that I found in that. Uh, we're a very good match. And yeah, I, I, I do feel the to a degree, I do feel the pressure of um, all of these sort of competing values and pulls in different directions. You know, mm -hmm. it is even for, for whatever you want to say about Tate's message, it, it adds more options into the water for like, oh, well, maybe it should be the case that mm -hmm. that, that uh, you should convert to Islam and, and try and have four wives. Like that's n not my path, but every time that a new narrative gets added, the path becomes a little bit less clear. Mm -hmm. uh, thankfully for me, I've always known that I wanted to be a dad. I've always known that I wanted to have a traditional family, but even I can see from like having observed it from the outside, I'm like, yeah. wow, this can become really like difficult for yeah. people. And I think it's going to take a lot of work to try and turn down the volume of the conversation between men and women to make this effective again. Yeah. And I think, you know, I remember being in your position and then being where I am now. And it's the, the challenge I always had was your wife, mate, partner, whatever you want to call it, doesn't necessarily need me to go carry a rock up the mountain every day. She just wants me home. Just, you know, just be home. You don't need to be this. What? So you have these goals of you want to make an impact. You want to be this communicator. You want to be this messaging for, you know, what you're passionate about. And then that competes with time for your spouse, you know. So they just want you around. You have these goals. That's always, that's hard. You need to find somebody who aligns with your desires for mm -hmm. life. You know, I, I think I see this very well with Kish mm -hmm. and Goggins. Yeah. That she is just there to help him be the best version of him. Mm -hmm. And him being the best version of him allows him to show up for her in the best way as well. Right. You know, the tiny amount of time that I've got to see yeah. those two together. That seems to be the dynamic of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And yeah, man, but... It, it's difficult. Like as a, as a driven guy with high capacity and goals that you want to achieve in life, do you want, do you want to sacrifice that fulfillment existentially for fulfillment in terms of a relationship? Mm -hmm. And the goal is obviously to find a partner that allows you to do both, mm -hmm. that takes pride and respect from the hard work that you put in. Mm -hmm. That's the dream. But for a lot of people, they, you know, they, do, they struggle to find that kind of a partner. Yeah. That was, you, you mentioned respect again, like the, your spouse would have to respect your hunger and your drive and your passion for whatever. And, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, what I always wanted to do is, yeah, did I need to go run all these miles? Should I have just been home with the kids? But there's also this other flip side of maybe I'm not home, but I'm also showing them what hard work can result in and being the example. And that's, I've always, I've struggled with that because I, you know, do I need to leave the house at night to go run in the rain? Yeah, I mean, is it subconsciously telling 
showing my kids that it's going to take hard work if you're going to stand out. Setting and, an example is a pretty good way to, I mean, dude, dude your kids are beasts. <laughs> like, you mm-hmm. know, like in the nicest way possible, they're fucking freaks. Like mm-hmm. they, they do things that nobody else would do. And that's because of the values that have been inculcated from yourself. There's probably people though that would, would say that they had the same goals I did and then it didn't turn out their kids weren't, their kids struggled, their kids had abandonment issues, their kids, their dad was never around. So <laughs> what, what makes an effective like parenting style is so like, who the fuck knows? Man? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, so there's a, a field of behavioral genetics, which is how your genes, what you inherit from your parents biologically impacts your outcomes in life, mm-hmm. right? So it's anxiety, alcoholism, depression, happiness, set point, uh, IQ, f- fucking shoe size, everything, mm-hmm. right? And at least 50% of pretty much everything that you are isn't determined by your environment. And it's not like it's just, oh, you take father plus mother and you're a combination of the two. There's all manner of weird versions of you sitting inside of sperm and eggs Mm -hmm. and it can come together and it can be, oh, well, it's not you. It's actually your great, great, great grandpa who happened to have this weird quirk. And you go, you know, you as the get hard things, lift rock, like Mm -hmm. keep hammering guy could have some creative fucking grandfather Mm -hmm. who was an artist or a musician. And you're like, where the fuck? fuck did this come musician yeah. kid come from yeah. i have a friend dr Stu mcgill he's the number one back pain specialist on the planet he's got uh two sons and a daughter uh, he is a very hard big mustached canadian man who has spent his entire life doing science and hard things built his own house all a phenomenal human very very powerful guy one daughter uh became a ship captain mm. you think yeah i see the alignment yeah. there the uh, other son became a um a doctor and like a building something something to do with architecture i think again like i can see the line the third son went to theater school mm. and became this unbelievable i think he did dance like some sort of dance or maybe ballet or something like that he's a savage mm-hmm. but it's very different and right. you go, where the f- fuck did that yeah. come from yeah it did so you just don't know the outcomes that you're going to get and mm-hmm. i mean parenting styles is something that i part of the reason i can't wait to have kids is i can't wait to learn and go deep on parenting yeah um but i don't think that you get to choose that the, the, the best that you can really do with regards to kids is set a good example be there for them you know instill in them the values that you think would be effective there's not really much else that's left to do yeah yeah it's a. Uh... I mean, I, I think I, I struggled with my first son, maybe got a little better, was pretty easy by the time my daughter was born, but I'll be between there. I was 20 some years old to 30 some years old. You change as, as a person and of course as a dad. So yeah, it's a, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting to me. Um, the, the last, last topic I wanted to touch on, and I know you've mentioned it before, but you had a thousand days of no alcohol. I was interested in, in what you learned from a thousand days of no alcohol. And um, was there such a benefit that it made you not want to ever drink again? Or what was that journey like? Yeah, so the UK is a big lager lout culture, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you're a young guy from a working class town like I was. You know, I went to uni and I went to a what's class as a red brick uni, so like a high high class uni or whatever. Um, but even that, like, it's just a, it's a drinking culture. Yeah. You know, everybody gets smashed most nights per week. Mm-hmm. And that was my life. Not only was I doing that recreationally, but that was also a good amount of time that I spent at work. You know, I was monetizing this alcohol yeah. culture in the UK and contributing to it as well and encouraging it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got to sort of 23, 24 and training really started to become important to me. So I dialed back my partying and I'd maybe only party once every couple of weeks mm-hmm. and I'd work a lot. Um, and then it got to 27, 28 and I'd had this sort of uh, epiphany out the other side of the uh, reality TV stuff. And I thought, fuck. Like I I need more time. I need more consistency. Mm -hmm. I felt like I would make good progress and then I'd get the Friday afternoon itch, which is this compulsion to like just be a degenerate and get Mm -hmm. on it with the boys, which is fun. But I knew that I needed more time, more money, more energy and more consistency if I wanted to make the changes that I needed to. Mm -hmm. Like fundamental changes to the way that you see the world are really, really hard to do. 
And if I was resetting my progress every two weeks mm -hmm. because I was spending a day hungover in bed or a day and a half hungover in bed or whatever, I wasn't going to get anywhere. And I was sick of this like Groundhog Day style, two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, two steps back. I was never able to hit a streak with meditation or reading or make any fundamental changes because I was just like shaking the Etch-A-Sketch mm -hmm. every couple of weeks. Right. So I thought, right, well, w what happens if I go sober for six months mm -hmm. and I'll see if that impacts my performance? Uh, and I loved it. Like I found I had basically an extra, you know, day every two weeks free to myself because mm -hmm. I wasn't getting drunk. I had better consistency that started to compound over time, went back to drinking for a little while, didn't really enjoy it, did another six months, went back to drinking after that for like two or three months, didn't really enjoy it. And then was like, right, fuck it, I'm just going to do a thousand days. Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly impactful for me because it gave me focused consistency. Mm -hmm. um, I think going sober is the most effective competitive advantage for most young people to do because it just gives you so much more mental clarity and ability mm -hmm. to be consistent. What you're doing when you choose to drink is basically electing to have a self-induced illness mm -hmm. for a day every two weeks. Like if this was, a, if, if, the, if this came from outside of your own choice, you would fucking hate whoever this person was. You would feel like it was a, like torture. Mm -hmm. Like it was a, hang on, so you're telling me that whatever it is, like 7% of my life is going to be spent like this. Mm -hmm. th th this is agony, but because it's you and because it's a rite of passage and because it's like a byproduct of, of a fun night the night before. So yeah, I did this thousand days sober and um, it was it was great. Um, coming out the other side of it, my relationship with alcohol, which was already very uh, balanced, mm -hmm. right? I didn't have a problem with alcohol. I wasn't dependent on it at all. I just wanted more from my life. Right. Uh, but the strange thing about going sober is that it's very, it's a very odd uh, pursuit to do if you don't have an addiction. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is the only drug where if you don't do it, people assume you have a problem. Right. I've, I've heard that. I've heard you say that. And that does make sense. It's yeah. true. It's very odd. Uh, the, actually, yeah. the other one I lie, I did realize after I said that, that caffeine is probably the other one. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't, I don't drink caffeine. You go, what? How? Yeah. But with alcohol, you know, you'd speak to any, especially working class person in the UK. And it's like, you've claimed that you're Jesus mm -hmm. or something. And you yeah. go like, what? How do you, how, I did, surely not. No, are you okay? Never. Like, yes, I'm absolutely fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's been changed a little bit. The, what's called the low and no movement, low alcohol, no alcohol is uh, really taking uh, up steam. Uh, Heineken Zero Zero sponsors all of the Formula One. Mm. So, you know, it's obvious that they see a massive uh, yeah. opening in the market for it. Uh, but then I did um, the thousand days and I was like, right, okay, well, I'm going to go back to drinking. Dude, I'm such a lightweight now. Like mm -hmm. my, my alcohol tolerance is through the floor. And the main thing that it's done is it's stopped that uh, desire to go out and, and party hard mm. um, because that was inculcated from work, right? Yeah. Like, and a lot of people will feel this, that your rite of passage, the stuff that you do as a young guy going mm -hmm. away on holiday or going to Vegas or doing whatever, yeah. like that's what you bonded with your friends over. Yeah. And that's cool. But, you know, you used to play with Power Rangers when you were 11. Right. You don't play with them anymore. Right. Like the, the Can tools, yeah, the mm -hmm. tools and the experiences that formed you when you were younger aren't necessarily the ones that will serve you when you're older. Yeah. And yeah, I, I also didn't like the idea that I, I used alcohol to give me social confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons for that was that I was in social situations that I didn't want to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was able to sedate myself out of realizing that I didn't want to be there by just getting drunk. Everyone knows this situation. Yeah. Your missus says that we've got to go to such and such's birthday party and you know that they're boring as fuck. So you've got to go, but you're like, oh, it's fine. I'm just going to get drunk. And if I get drunk, then it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But you never end up asking yourself the question of, why am I allowing myself to go to an event that I don't want to spend my time at? Yeah. And you sedate yourself out of that problem. Right. Uh, so I did that, came back to drinking, but it's very rare, very inconsistent. I would be mm -hmm. maybe, you know, every month or so for me, it's rarely like, uh, if I go on a plane, like if I'm going on a long trip, yeah. and the, the air hostess comes over and says, would you like champagne? So I'm like, yeah, I do want a champagne. Yeah. That'd be, that's nice. Gotcha. Um, but it's very limited. And then I did 500 days without caffeine, mm. uh, which I haven't done a video on yet, but I'm going to soon. And that was very interesting hmm. because I realized on the other side of the fence to alcohol, most people are propping up their confidence with alcohol and most hmm. people are propping up their fatigue with caffeine. Oh, And 
Alex Hormozy, one of my friends, has got this great quote where he says, if you can't perform without it, it stopped conferring a benefit. Right. Most, that makes sense. Like you're, you're no longer being uh, assisted by mm-hmm. caffeine. You need it in right. order to be able to perform. Yeah. And the problem that you have there is nobody ever stops to ask themselves, why am I tired at 11 a.m.? Mm-hmm. Why do I need caffeine at 11 a.m.? I've been up for four hours. What the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> Shouldn't be tired. But because you can paper over the cracks with the caffeine, yeah. you never end up saying, well, maybe my sleep routine's not so good. Oh, maybe I'm actually spending too much time on my phone. Oh, maybe I'm not actually eating well, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. And people don't even say I'm tired. People say, I need a coffee. Right. Say, so, oh, hang on a second. So you've supplemented your level of fatigue for the caffeine concentration in your blood. Mm-hmm. And... It's just, it's another eye opener. I really like this whole sort of sovereignty agency thing is like a big deal for me. I think it's because I didn't feel like I had a lot of that when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I don't like anything having control over me, any substance, any, anything. And I wanted to, okay, club promoter, thousand days sober, roger that. Yeah. Okay. Guy that used to stay up until four in the morning, three nights a week because he had to work and is now trying to be uh, productive and write and do podcasts and stuff like that. No caffeine, 500 days. Yeah. Away we go. Right. And I learned an awful lot about um, sleep. I reset my caffeine tolerance. I mm. didn't have headaches. I didn't have withdrawals, uh, which was fortunate because I know a lot of people do, especially people yeah. that are hot, that go hard on caffeine. Yeah. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend that everybody do that. Mm. Like the, both of them. They're the two substances that people, I think, are, they sneak under the surface without people realizing. You're yeah. Like the fucking, if you're taking opiates every night to go to sleep or if you're smoking weed, it's not yeah. hiding in the dark. Right. Like it's front and center. You know yeah. what's going on. Alcohol, to be able to get past your group of friends that aren't actually your friends, they're just drinking buddies, mm-hmm. or to uh, put up with the boring events that you take yourself to or to deal with your lack of social confidence. That yeah. sneaks under the, the the table a little bit, and then yeah. the same thing for caffeine. Yeah, I guess how I've you know some of it is just me wanting to justify to myself. But alcohol, the things that I cared about, alcohol wasn't helping. You know, I wanted to be more fit. I wanted to be more dis- disciplined. I wanted to be a, the best bow hunter, the best athlete. And alcohol was always a step backwards on all those things. So it's like, this is what I care. Caffeine hasn't, that I've noticed, been a step backwards on anything. Yeah, I might, maybe I would be sharper if I got a little more sleep, but it hasn't been like the the huge silver bullet that's just killing everything that I want to do. So um, alcohol definitely was. I mean, I that thousand days sober was intriguing to me just because... I, alcohol, I did have a problem and it was, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be who I am if I would have kept drinking. That's how powerful it is. So I was interested in, in uh, your journey there on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, such a powerful drug. I mean, it's, it's an acceptable one and uh, people don't realize the, uh, the poison that it is. But yeah. I think with, with regards to your use of caffeine, man, like it, what you're doing, if you were trying to do that without it would be very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, this is how people can become reliant on stuff mm-hmm. and it not seem like they are. Right. Uh, you know, if you wanted to do the RX plus version of whatever you're already doing, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, how, how much can I just start to dial that dose back just a little bit and mm-hmm. see if I still perform? That being said, with alcohol, everybody kind of has it in the back of their mind that it's not really, uh, it's not good for them. Yeah, yeah. man people get fucking upset when I start pointing out their use of caffeine. They get really, (laughs) really upset. You fucking piece of shit. Who do you, this is because you've got no joy in your life because you don't have a coffee first thing in the morning and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, whoa, hey, I'm just (laughs) saying, I'm just saying that I think your life could be a little better if you needed less caffeine in Mm -hmm. order to be able to perform the way that you do. And the problem that you have is because it's not, it's not socially unacceptable. You can't go out of the office at midday and have two pints and come back in. Right. right? But you can happily go out and get a quad shot, vanilla fucking supercharged rocket fuel bullshit. Are you talking about me? Come on now. You got me one yesterday. You, (laughs) you, you might've noticed I actually only drank about a quarter of it. yesterday. It would have taken my fucking face off. That's why (laughs) I started vibrating. You're like, right, man. And we're just going to stay nice and steady with that front arm. Like, dude, this is, my entire body at the moment (laughs) is like at 1000 hertz yeah um however i think that just assessing like how much do i rely on stuff and this can be for anything right Right. how much do i rely on social media in order to be able to distract me when i get bored Mm -hmm. why can't you sit with boredom 
Right. How much do I need to use television to calm me down in the nighttime? Well, why mm. are you not calm? How much do I need caffeine to be able to wake myself up? How much do I need alcohol to yeah. calm myself down? Blah, blah, blah. Like yeah. all of these different things. Symptom of the cure. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. Interesting. I mean, I'm, I just wanted to cap this off by saying how thankful I am, Chris, that you came out here. I know Oregon is the middle of nowhere and, uh, you know, to share the lift run shoot experience, my life with you is, uh, is powerful for me. And, um, before we go, one of my favorite things to do is expose people to the world of archery and hopefully bow hunting it someday. And so I'd like to welcome you to the bow hunting brotherhood. Here's your bow. Man, this is so fucking cool. <laughs> and you shot a great yesterday. It was amazing. Dude, I shot a, a balloon at 50 yards. I know. With this. First day ever shooting a bow. Within two hours three hours yeah it's weighing the wizard for you Dude, it's so <laughs> this is so beautiful and i have a ton of friends in austin that are going to absolutely hate the fact that you've given this to me because uh i'm now going to be able to compete with them on whatever it is they do oh. i mean this is just for a second look at how much of a fucking weapon this is it's a beautiful it's so yeah. cool man beautiful piece of equipment i can see why you guys get obsessed by it yeah um definitely it's phenomenal and I, I, this is just you know what a beautiful way to cap off what's been a, an awesome few days yeah well for me building the bow hunting brotherhood is that's my mission in life it feels like because bow hunting has changed my life i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for bow hunting i'd still be out in that little small town we went and visited yesterday so it's had a life-changing impact on me and that's why it's i feel like it's uh you know my mission to share that impact with others and that's i'm very thankful you came out and you you, you were mastered it so quickly i mean shooting so well and just being at the bow rack and then capping that off with the training and the lifting it's like man best day ever for me thank you every step i take i move my truth every time they tell me stop i you every comment hate that makes my feel gather up my energy and boom them talking saying the way that i move is so reckless that is a part of my mind i've been blessed with giving my blood so i am relentless my fault they want someone to blame they sent their hate it fuels my pace i am roy tough i am the change the few endure feeling like cam haynes <laughs>